That's okay. I'm Charlotte Feldman Jacobs, Program Director for Gender here at CRD and one of the co-chairs of the Gender-Based Violence Task Force of the Interagency Gender Working Group. And as you all know, this is a event to focus on faith-based organizations and gender-based violence. And as I was talking to Jeff, who I will introduce in a minute, um, I keep saying, how have we not done this before? So um, we are doing it finally. We have a fabulous lineup for today. And my co-chair on the Gender-Based Violence Task Force, Rose Wilcher, is at FHI 360 in North Carolina. She's also on the phone as our <coughs> 60 some people, I'm told. So we're going to try and remember to bring them into the discussion. And um, first, I would like to introduce Jeff, who really was some of the driving force behind this when I said, What do you think about? And we were off. Um, good morning. And uh, my name is Jeff Jordan. I'm president and CEO of PRB. And so, because we kind of own the space, I get a chance to say good morning and welcome. Um, this is an effort by a multitude of groups. It is the um, GBV task force within the IGWG that is the setting in, this which, in which this takes place. But for me, it's a very important morning. Um, it, it's a chance to bring together, uh, for me personally and for many in this room, a set of issues that do have an important confluence and we need to be both gathering strength from what we know from each other as well as sharing our connections and other kinds of things. Again, we're very excited that there are any number of overlapping working groups that seem to be converging on this topic. So the IGWG and the Gender Based Violence Task Force is certainly part of that. Um, but I know that Gene Duff and, and JLI have put this out within theirs. I currently um, am coordinating or helping launch a renewed effort within the Global Health Council on faith and Global Health, um, and thanks to Jean also for having joined in the relaunch of that group. Um, and so another overlapping group that looks at the intersections of faith and health, um, and certainly this topic is important within that context. So, you know, please share and spread what you learn here. And you know, there's there's so much important work that's going on for us to be able to move forward towards the elimination of gender-based violence, and it's critically important that the role that faith communities play in it be both highlighted, reinforced, challenged, um, so that we move this issue forward. It's a fantastic panel. I'll turn it back to Charlotte for the introductions, but you know, my personal thanks to all the panel members for being here. I'm very much looking forward to this. Thank you all. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> so a couple of housekeeping things before we get going. We are going to go straight through to 11.30. And we always think we're not going to use all that time, and we always do. So there's bathroom keys in the back, and there's breadcrumbs all through the office that will get you there and get you back in on the keys that are in the basket back there. We have, um, as I said, 60-some people online. We will try and bring them in for questions. Um, you have an option of either saying you would like to ask your own question when we recognize you, or ask um, our staffer, Laura Bloom, to read the questions for you. Um, I will introduce each speaker before they speak. We'll have uh, clarifying questions for about five minutes after each of the presentations, and then we've saved a very large block at the end for dialogue, which is always my favorite part. So without further ado, I will present our first speaker. And Jean, you have an option of sitting up here, standing here, we have clicker, you can see the PowerPoint's already up there. So our first presenter is Jean Duff, who is the president of the Partnership for Faith and Development and coordinator of the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities. She is co-founder of the Center for Interfaith Action on Global Poverty. We're building on work, her work in Mozambique. She developed a new business model to link the multi-faith sector to the public sector for impact on malaria. She uh, is an epidemiologist and a clinical psychologist, and she has broad experience in convening and funding cross-sector networks of collaboration 
and in the startup of nonprofit social enterprises. So quite a cross section, James. We have a technical problem, so yeah. Okay, <laughs> and I will give you um, five minutes, two minutes. <coughs> okay. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, Hello everybody, what a great room, and hello to the 60 plus people on the phone, that's a really impressive group of folks who are interested uh, in this fascinating topic. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying I'm not a religious nutter, um, but I am extremely interested and have been for many, many years uh, about the potential um, of religious and faith-based influence for good, um, for good uh, across the board in the development and in the humanitarian sphere. And uh, I guess just to, that, that's what motivates me and, and that's what interests me. I do take, uh, by virtue of my background, uh, an evidence-based focus to this question. It tends to be a very mushy question. Um, uh, and uh, I think that we're all well served to the extent that we are uh, more specific from an evidence point of view. So um, as Charlotte said, I coordinate the joint learning initiative on faith and local communities. My colleague Stacey Nam is sitting over there, the knowledge manager for the uh, Joint Learning Initiative. Folks on the phone can see the slides, can they, Charlotte? Great, thank you very much. So we'll go to the next slide, if you please. Uh, I've been asked to set the stage for our esteemed panel this morning by just maybe giving some general background information about religion, faith, and sexual and gender-based violence. But I'd like to start by uh, saying a word or two more about the Joint Learning Initiative. The JLI, as we call it, um, started in 2012 and it came out of the interest and concern of a very broad group of uh, faith-based leaders, religious leaders, heads of international faith-based charities, uh, academics who are interested in the topic, and policymakers uh, who were concerned for the endemic and sort of systematic um, uh, uh, underutilization um, and indeed uh, very often strongly opposing views uh, towards the contribution, the activity and the contribution of religious and faith-based organizations in the development sphere. And after a series of almost two years of fascinating discussions about what one could do about that, um, we decided that we would focus on the dimension of evidence, uh, that we would try to collect what is known, um, to understand what isn't known, um, and to communicate it better to policymakers and to practitioners. Um, we adopted a learning hub approach. Uh, we were very fortunate to be schooled by Jeff Foster, who many of you may know from Zimbabwe, who had uh, uh, developed a very sophisticated learning hub uh, approach uh, to the question of optimal conditions of care for children affected by AIDS. And uh, he came and, and schooled us on this. And the learning hubs have developed over the years uh, at JLI. They're always a collection of academics, policymakers, and uh, practitioners. Uh, who have expertise and interest in the question of the, what does faith have to do with this particular theme or this particular topic. Uh, they're voluntary, I mean, it, it, is, it is truly a joint learning activity and they convene mostly virtually, but uh, when possible um, uh, in person. And they systematically ask the question, what do we know? Uh, what were the gaps in knowledge? Uh, what additional research could uh, really be enlightening? And then how do we communicate that better? Our vision is for the full and appropriate engagement of the capacities of faith-based groups in the achievement of the SDGs through effective partnerships with public sector and secular entities, as well as among religious groups themselves. Uh, so we're going for scale up in engagement um, and uh, are very excited to see some of the developments in that regard. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, one of the many uh, active hubs uh, is the uh, hub on the uh, sexual and gender-based violence. If you could do the next slide, please. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, Prabhu uh, here, who, who uh, is an active member of that hub from Tier Fund, uh, as well as others in the room whose organizations are also represented. The hub's co-chairs are Liz Dartnell from SVRI, uh, just been very active in Brazil, and Diana Arango from the World Bank. And Dina O'Sullivan uh, from Tier Fund serves as the hub Secretariat, secretariat leader, cheerleader, 
uh, source of uh, inspiration. Uh, those of you who know me know what a marvelous woman she is. The hub uh, started uh, back in 2014. It conducted a scoping study, uh, which is available on the JNI website. Um, a very broad overview of religion, faith, and sexual and gender-based violence. Um, they brought a very important uh, brief uh, to the World Humanitarian Summit, um, looking at uh, SGBV in the humanitarian context. And uh, they're now well into uh, an important um, piece of research um, uh, that is funded by DFID um, on harmful practices, and looking at the role of religion um, in harmful practices against women uh, and what can be done about it. Um, they also contribute to a very important article, sort of an overview article in the Review of Faith and International Affairs called Getting Dirty, Working with Faith Leaders uh, in 2016. I commend that. that those, all of these references uh, are available on the JNI website. A quick glance at the diversity of members in the hub. Um, You'll see the hub draws a very diverse and international group uh, of folks who are engaged in one way or another, some more actively than others, but engaged in the exchange. So going to the complicated question, next slide please, uh, of religion and sexual gender-based violence. I mean, let's start off uh, by the other, naming the elephant in the room, uh, which is that uh, religious and faith actors uh, without doubt contribute both directly and indirectly uh, to factors uh, that relate to sexual and gender-based violence. And there's absolutely no question about that, and there's no rose-colored glasses about it. Um, so maybe looking first at the challenges, um, which, and again, I'm just setting the stage. My, my partners here will, will be unpacking this in much greater detail. So it's true that faith communities uh, uh, and, and their patriarchal cultures uh, reinforce gender inequality uh, and harmful practices. They contribute to stigma. Um, they can be unwilling to engage uh, on SGBV as one of many taboo topics that they are unwilling to engage in and can perpetuate uh, harmful practices. Uh, a study of Jewish, uh, Muslim, and Christian faith leaders uh, in multiple countries showed that they systematically underestimate the prevalence of gender-based violence, and that they are simply basically unaware uh, of, of its prevalence. Uh, faith leaders may contribute also to re-traumatizing survivors, to folks who, who seek help and then are rebuffed and stigmatized within their own communities. And, and these uh, challenges have all been well documented. But, and I think the important and exciting thing about this, uh, this morning's session is that there are many opportunities uh, in relation to uh, engagement and collaboration with faith actors. Uh, because, of course, uh, of their incredibly powerful influence um, uh, and, and the high religiosity, particularly in low-income countries uh, where religiosity is the highest. So just uh, unpacking our little, uh, our little circle here, when, I, when we think about opportunities, we think about the faith community's reach. They're everywhere. Uh, they're not going away. Uh, they're in the smallest village. Uh, we think about the, the diversity of faith communities' response. So they are involved in prevention, they're involved in shelter, they're involved in counseling, they're involved in medical referral, they're involved in mobilizing their communities. They have a very broad possibility of response. Uh, next slide, please. They have a strongly holistic approach. Uh, so unlike ourselves, they're not slicing and dicing according to the latest funding stream or um, the topic of interest. Uh, they're interested in the whole person and the whole community. Um, it, it, Obviously, in, in our view, um, those of us who, who work with the faith community uh, day in and day out feel that the uh, strong secular ideology and secular bias is leading to a systematic uh, underutilization of local faith communities and the power of local faith communities to change key attitudes and behaviors related to big problems like sexual and gender-based violence. Um, in terms of the holistic approach, I'd like to just uh, mention a couple of, of areas uh, where we know um, that faith communities can really make a positive difference, um, particularly in the area of addressing stigma would be one um, of, of the major areas that we know. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the um, impact on resilience uh, and on recovery um, of the spiritual uh, dimension. Um, one study showed that after an 11-session psychotherapy group um, in which 
Christian su survivors of trauma um, uh, used a spiritual recovery action plan that built on trauma recovery and empowerment models um, that the women had significantly reduced post-traumatic stress systems even three months after the group had ended. Uh, so we have a strong sense that that where the spiritual dimension is important to women, uh, that really building on that and working with faith leaders makes a big difference. Faith actors can also be powerful influencers of attitudes and behaviors uh, which uh, affect stigma, and uh, there's really good work on that. Next slide, please. When it comes to the trust and influence on social norms, uh, those of you who have known me for a long time will know that these are two of my favorite um, faith leaders in Nigeria. Uh, on the far right is now Cardinal John Anaiken, who's the Archbishop of Abuja, and on the left is the Sultan of Sokoto from uh, northern Nigeria, who together um, joined forces uh, to mount what is probably the largest ever uh, national scale faith mobilization uh, in Nigeria around changing attitudes and behaviors towards uh, malaria and towards using nets and uh, were uh, have really been enormously successful. It was funded by the World Bank, um, surprise, surprise, and uh, who worked closely uh, through the Ministry of Health. It was aligned with the Ministry of Health National Campaign. And it's, it, I put them up because it's one of the, 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 the in a sense, they're my poster boys um, for what faith influence, well educated, well equipped, well mobilized, well financed, can do um, in, in a state in Nigeria uh, that had full faith mobilization. Almost 100% more kids. Uh, were sleeping under nets um, than in a state that had just the Ministry of Health uh, mobilization. So we know that this is a very powerful influence that can really be tapped. Um, in DRC, um, Tearfront actually uh, did a, a very interesting study um, of um, attitudes of, of women towards the um, credibility of faith leaders. Are those bells for me? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, and, and found that even if a woman was not a member of the faith leaders, the, the religious leaders' faith community, that uh, his influence and his attitudes uh, towards uh, sexual and gender-based violence behavior were influential and important to her. Uh, so it was an important study. The thing about the trust and influence, in, in my experience, in, in, in working in this area for many, many years now, is, is how exciting it is that, that faith leader behavior can be changed. And I collect, I go through life collecting examples to prove that. I think about the Yemen, for example, um, with the uh, engagement of uh, local faith leaders on, on child marriage, or a huge issue in, in, in child marriage. A very large scale uh, study funded by USAID found that in one of the governance um, that after engagement of, of uh, the, the local faith leaders, that the age of child marriage actually increased in, so, you know, a very thoughtful, theologically based uh, intervention that actually emphasized that they felt, the study felt that, that it was the information about the impact of child marriage on the girl's health, the girl's morbidity and mortality, that was the key influencer in changing faith leaders' behavior. So, it, to underscore, and I'm sure we'll hear many other examples um, from the panelists, but the possibility of change. Look at, for example, the worldwide movement called We Will Speak Out, uh, where Faith leaders are encouraged to, INA World Health is, is the sponsor in the United States um, for this wonderful network. But faith leaders are encouraged to open their houses of worship as safe spaces and to reach out and mobilize community resources for the benefit of women. So the capacity for change is something that I, I think is very exciting that we should, we should look at and consider in a very practical way. Um, just moving on very quickly to touch on, uh, I know you'll be hearing uh, a number of case studies uh, this morning um, from our partners. The uh, Islamic Relief Worldwide, interestingly, have taken up a system uh, of intervention that was developed by World Vision uh, called Channels of Hope and have adapted it for use uh, with Muslim communities uh, in many, many countries. Uh, a, a big uh, set of in interventions are just mentioned here in Mali, Niger, and Pakistan, where community hope action teams um, basically gather the key community stakeholders, in particular including uh, religious leaders, to address gender-based violence and child protection issues. Um, in terms of the faith uh, context, I mean, clearly faith leaders uh, are, are 
no surprise to you, are heavily involved in both religious and tribal issues uh, and inter-family disputes. Um, the, in, in these Muslim majority contexts, um, the faith leaders were primarily involved as community champions who helped to build trust, influence communities, and support change. Next slide, please. The key learnings in terms of faith leader involvement from the uh, interventions in those three countries um, were, first of all, that the intervention uh, methodologies and targets were similar, but all varied according to local cultural uh, situations um, and religious sensitivities. The role of faith leader is very important in supporting survivors uh, where formal services are limited. For example, in Niger, uh, there is no public system uh, of safe houses for SGB survivors or GBV survivors, which puts them at risk. So community and faith leaders handle um, uh, those cases and handle shelter. Uh, religious leaders, uh, again, in this study have been shown to have a wide sphere of influence to uh, to uh, actually impact change. Faith leaders develop plans to discuss women's and children's rights in the regular <coughs> ceremonies and during marriage ceremonies. Moving forward, next slide, please. And just in summary, and again, I know that this is going to be further illustrated by the uh, panelists coming up. Um, I, I would say that, that the evidence that is ev evolving from the uh, learning hub um, on sexual and gender-based violence and from related research is that faith actors can help in humanitarian action uh, to be more responsive, holistic, and inclusive. Local faith actors tend to be hugely shut out of humanitarian uh, response. Uh, as you know, um, the World Humanitarian Summit um, documented that only 0.2% um, of, of, of global humanitarian resources are going to national and local partners. And certainly among the local partners, uh, the faith actors themselves would be fairly significantly discriminated against and shut out by the uh, international entities. Um, local religious leaders are trusted and have authority. Uh, sometimes that authority is not uh, for the good when it comes to this issue, uh, but we know that it can be uh, modified. Faith networks can reach a diverse range of community members. They work on a large scale. They support social and cultural, as well as material need. In terms of uh, what I would uh, encourage us all to do uh, as we uh, explore the possibility of increased engagement with faith leaders, I would encourage everybody, first of all, to listen to local faith actors and understand what it is that they want and what it is that they need. What they see as the challenges, what they see as the opportunities, one. Number two, educate and equip faith leaders. Uh, there are an extraordinary range now of tools, uh, scripture-based uh, methodologies that uh, have demonstrated effectiveness in supporting and engaging faith leaders. Partner with the faith community. Don't use the faith community. Um, there's a, a growing pushback by local faith actors against being so-called instrumentalized, and uh, uh, they are not don't see themselves generally as agents of development um, or project focused, uh, but they do want to partner for the good of their communities. Support inter-religious collaboration for social and cultural change. Um, attitudes and behaviors affecting uh, sexual and gender-based violence are community-wide, they're culturally embedded, they're endemic, and for true and lasting change to take place, uh, we need to work across religious communities, not just with one community and take an evidence-based approach. You will be surprised to hear me say. And in terms of the evidence-based approach, we invite you to join the Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Learning Hub if you're interested in going deeper on this question of evidence for religious and faith-based organizations. And Stacey, I think, even has a sign-up form over there. So <laughs> those of you on the phone, um, please go to the JLI website, which is given uh, here on the screen. And uh, if you are interested in joining the hub, we'd welcome you and we invite you to sign up. Thank you so much. Do we have any clarifying questions for Jean particularly? Any on the line? Clear? Well, thank you very much. Thank 
Thank you. I especially was taken by your point about partner with the faith community. Don't use them as tools. It's easy to do that when you're looking for next steps, but it, it sounds like it should be a first step and not a next step. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Prabhu Deepan. He's the gender technical lead at Tier Fund. Um, he leads the SGBB Prevention and Peace Building Initiative. He is fresh off the plane from Brazil, from the SBRI conference, as is our last speaker, Lynn Lowry. So we're getting, for those of you who weren't fortunate enough to go and hear the presentations there, this is the chance. Uh, in the last 10 years, he's contributed to the work on gender, SGBB, HIV, and AIDS, and human rights work of many organizations both in Sri Lanka and internationally. At Tier Funds, he leads the evidence-based transforming masculinities intervention in the DRC, Myanmar, Iraq, Nigeria, Liberia, Central African Republic, and the Central American region. Prior to joining Tier Fund, Prabhu was project manager for youth engagement, communications, and advocacy for CARE Sri Lanka's project on engaging men and boys to redefine for gender equality, known as EMERGE. He holds an MBA from the University of Wales, UK. Um, today, no surprise, Prabhu will be speaking about transforming masculinities, a faith-based approach to GBV prevention. Do you prefer to do your own? No, I think Okay. Good. Yeah. Once you pick us out, I'm sure everyone's wondering why you never would have an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to be a banker in my previous life, so that's wow. um, Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming, and I'm really excited to be here. My excitement uh, might not show because I've been on like this six flights in the last two weeks. I got to DC on. Uh, Saturday and I leave tonight home and I'm not looking forward to the long flight home. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited. Um, so as I am going to present um, on this intervention called Transform Masculinities, which is a faith-based approach to preventing JBV. Um, and uh, this, as um, Charlotte said, it's been implemented in several countries at different stages, and I'll explain a bit more that. Uh, just to give you a history of, uh, you can go to the next slide, just in terms of Tier Fund. Um, Tier Fund is a Christian, uh, really fun development agency working in about 50 countries, uh, and they are primarily, you know, working on you know standard uh, wash, uh, sanitation, you know, uh, projects, but also working through faith communities, mostly uh, Christian partners, but also where there's no Christian partners, they work with other partners in about 50 countries, mostly in humanitarian settings. Uh, our SGBV response was born in 2011, uh, building on the work on HIV and AIDS, and. What we've seen in our experience with HIV and AIDS is that the, how powerful faith leaders and communities can be realized in, in the response. And I think for all the good reasons and the bad reasons that Jean, uh, you know, explained, but also there's, uh, you know, meaningful engagement when they can really understand and accept and feel, you know, the impact it can have on people's lives and give them holistic, it can be a holistic response. So when we started looking at this work and what it meant for Tier Fund to take on, you know, the work on GBB or sexual violence at the time, uh, they started asking survivors, uh, you know, because I think Rina, who's my boss, her kind of strong belief is that the fact that when people who are most impacted have, you know, say and, in, and a voice in, in the work that we want to do in terms of response, I think it becomes painful because, again, in our work on HIV and AIDS, we realize when people living with HIV and AIDS got involved in the response and, and part of the program's designing and development and policies, etc., it became very meaningful. So our initial kind of uh, response, our initial kind of uh, entry point into this was listening to survivors. Uh, initially from DRC, Rwanda and Burundi, asking survivors what are their experiences around you know, sexual and gender-based violence, what is the response of the faith, and what is the experience of faith communities, but also what is their hope. And as Jean said, most of the times their experiences have not been positive. You know, it's, it's been, they've been re-traumatized, uh, it's not a safe space, they've been blamed for their you know, uh, you know, experience of sexual violence, 
but also what survivors said, but we are hopeful that it can be a place of healing because for them, religion and spirituality was important to them. So, that, so we took that those voices to at that time to the Archbishop of Canterbury in in, in London because we are based in London uh, and said this is what uh, these communities are saying: people affected by sexual and gender based violence, women who are survivors, female, right? this is what they're saying. What is your response? And our response to sexual and gender based violence was born out of that. Where the church said, we are complicit, not just you know ashamed, but complicit in in this act, and that our people belonging to our communities are suffering. So. That is how our sexual and gender based violence pro prevention program was formed. And then we, did, we do similar activities everywhere we do uh, our initial response. We listen to survivors and we take them as a follow up through a process called Healing of Memories, which is developed in, in South Africa as you know, a post apartheid you know, reconciliation program. It's the Healing of Memories instead. But we take them through the process. But before that, we listen to their voices and take them to the church, and church leaders and say, This is what they're saying. What, are, what is your response? And most often, their response is. is a sh you know, a sense of shame, a sense of, a sense of complicity, a sense of saying, I don't know what to do. You know, we want to do something, but we don't know what to do. And so this is what our sexual gender-based violence program uh, is born out of. And we focus on five main areas. Uh, one is how can faith leaders break this uh, silence? Because as Jim was saying, not, not just they're not aware, but most times they're silent. They, they do not break the silence on sexual and gender-based violence. So how do we provide spaces for them to break silence? And also, how do we equip and empower them to work with on this issue of sexual and gender violence? Well? And they're saying, okay, now we've broken the silence. What now? What are we, we, we know how to pray. We know how to counsel, but we don't know anything beyond that. So how do we accompany these faith leaders and communities in terms of journeying with them in, in an effective response? And then the third area is, is around how does, how does faith communities become a safe space for survivors? If so, people who are affected by sexual violence, sexual and gender violence, violence, or TBV, their primary kind of point of contact is the faith communities. Most often it is. They go to the faith leader, and it is not safe. How do we make it a safe space? Not a physical space alone, but a space where they're not blamed. They're not stigmatized. They're not shamed for what happened to them. And then also a movement of survivors. How can these survivors, the voices of survivors, influence and shape policies and programs? Not just with the church, but also their local governments and governments, et cetera. Uh, and the area that I lead is around you know, working with men and boys, men and boys. I'll explain that what that means. Uh, it's not just men and boys, uh, but you know, how do we engage? Because they were like, "Why are you talking to us?" You know, we, we didn't bring it upon ourselves. Why not work with men and boys as well? Because most times, you know, they are the ones who are the perpetrators. And so, how do we engage with men and boys from that perspective? And we also have a focus on ending female genital mutilation and cutting, which uh, also is in different countries that we're implementing, and, and it's again working, working with faith leaders and communities on this. Um, and an emerging theme that uh, you'd have seen from my, uh, you know, title, sexual and gender-based violence, peace building. You know, what does it have to do with each other? So, like, one of the things that we are exploring a lot of these days is like the interlinkages there. So, most of the countries that we're working in, in conflict settings like Iraq, in Nigeria, in DRC, you know, can we look at a broader uh, Central African Republic? Can we look at a broader conversation that can also look at social cohesion, etc.? So that's kind of a bit of background. Of CF1 and the work that we're doing. The transfer masculinity approach. So when CF1 started working on uh, with survivors, they were like, "Do you want to work with men and boys? What do we do?" And we really wanted to know, you know, how do we work with men and boys in an effective way? And so we started looking at, uh, you know, we did a, uh, a gain of formative study looking at attitudes of men and uh, boys and women and girls around mas men and masculinity, and especially on gender. And we wanted to understand how do we meaningfully engage with men and boys. And communities on gender and GBV. And one of the key things that we found is that people are consistently using uh, scriptures to justify harmful norms. And we have not just the faith leaders, but also like the members of the faith community. So we started exploring, you know, what are some key things that are coming that we need to start working on, but also like what are key scriptures that people have been using to justify certain behaviors, certain practices, certain norms. And, and we want to really focus on how do we address this. If we are to meaningfully address this work, that we need to start looking at these scriptures as well. So that's kind of transforming masculinity's approach, which focuses, our primary focus is in promoting gender equality. So the framework is, the, the fact is that the cause, root causes of GBV is based in gender inequality. So without talking about gender inequality, there's no way we can talk about GBV prevention. How do we do that in a way that is uh, meaningful, uh, acceptable, and safe within faith communities? Because obviously, to talk about gender equality, then you have to also talk about patriarchy. And then, you know, talking about patriarchy in faith institutions, which is, you know, 
foundation of it. <laughs> you know, how do you do that in a safe way? And one of the things that I've realized that I've been doing this work for the last four years, and I've never used the word patriarchy. It, it, you know, I've talked about male dominance, male control, I've talked about you know, gender inequality, because I think people are sensitive to certain things like that. When you talk about masculine, it's like, what about feminists? What about women? You know, so how do you do it in a way that challenges the core of you know, what you're talking about, but also like in a sensitive way, when people are ready to talk about this? When we started talking about sexual and gender race, one of the was like, hey, so I was out there. Let's, we need to do something. We feel bad, we feel broken, and that's what's the initial response. Then we, we were like, actually, they're not just out there, they're in your church. And then also we are saying, hey, the survivors are not only in your church, but the perpetrators are also in your church. And then we moved into conversation saying, hey, not that just that, we are justifying what you preach, what you teach, it's also justifying and perpetrating this harmful non-sexual threat. It has been a gradual you know, move, conversation. It's not like we didn't go with a you know, kind of checklist and say, can we talk about this, can we talk about this? It didn't work that way. It has been a journey, and there have been moments that I've punched walls and I've you know, screamed at myself you know, after coming home to you know, my white walls in a room, you know, just because sometimes it's so difficult, but it has been a gradual conversation with them. And I, I can honestly say it's moved so much. You know, it's for me, starting as a city, in terms of working with this, for me, as religion and spiritual is important, but also challenging for me. It has been an interesting journey for myself as well. And I think that's one of the most important things that I have realized. It is not straightforward, it is complex. So, transforming masculinity is that it's a faith based in, uh, approach to you know, promoting gender equality. And also, we talk about masculinity, like what are positive ways of being men and women, uh, and also, you know, fatherhood, et cetera. But that's not our primary focus. I'll explain a little bit more. Can you move to the next slide, please? So, transforming masculinity uh, process, in a sense, is a three step process. We realize that it's easy to give a kind of a sermon guide to pastors and say, preach this, and they will do it. They will like, they can preach it with all the conviction, but it's more difficult for them to look at internally and reflect on their personal biases, personal, you know, their attitudes, how they treat the women in their own lives, in their own church, etc. So we want to make sure that we go through with them the same process. So this is the initial step of the uh, transformation process is about the faith leaders themselves. And we usually start, if it's a structured institutionalized religion, like if we work the uh, Anglican Communion and you have the Archbishop at each country level and you have the dioceses and the parishes, we start with the national you know, kind of faith leaders. We start with the Archbishop and his team. And, and we engage them through the same process where they go through unpacking gender, you know, the root causes of gender, GBB, and you know, what it means for them, their own attitudes, reflect a critical reflection around their personal attitudes, et cetera, so that we take them through the process of transformation. We believe, if people believe, in gender equality, then what they preach will reflect that. And they will look at the scriptures and interpret scriptures from that lens. So it is easier to give a sermon guide, but it's much more meaningful to look at you know, their own lives, their own behaviors, their own relationships, and promote an alternative. Because most often what we've seen is that I can do a training for like three days, I can do a three-year project, but if these are the messages that are being reinforced every Sunday, every Friday at the press, I can't compete with that. And their sanction, their incentive for listening to their basis is going to heaven. I can't do that. I can't say, hey, at the end of this three day training, I can promise you eternal life. I can't do that. You know? <laughs> so, seriously, I mean, because that's the reason. That's, you know, and so how do we then make transform this message that's being preached? How can we reinforce positive norms? Norms that, you know, affirm the, you know, values and principles of gender equality and challenges intimate partner violence and gender based violence. So the first step is working with faith leaders across the different levels. And the second is that we, wherever our community projects are being implemented, we center it around the congregations. And we train people, lay leaders, and anybody the faith leader nominates uh, as the champions, which means they're trained facilitators. They are people who are interested in doing this work. They are also people who can commit their time to facilitating community dialogues, which is the third, third step, but also willing to go through the process themselves. As part of standard uh, you know, process, Everyone goes through the process. Whoever wants to get involved in this work have to go through the same process to begin with. There has to be reflection on their own lives. They have to commit to personal transformation. Um, and that's kind of how we want to emphasize on this work. And these gender champions, usually we train about 16 gender champions, you know, and they are equal member uh, men and women, not because we talk about 50-50, it's not that. It's because they have to recruit men and women from the same communities and congregations to do the community dialogues. The community dialogues are a six-week process, a dialogue series, which is facilitated separately in single-sex groups for five weeks with men 
and women separately from the same community, and the six weeks they come together. And we've developed the tool that takes them on a weekly process, to, you know, and in different conversations for men and women, uh, so that men and women are reflecting on their lives, but not, you know, women are not looking at them saying, hey, I'm supposed to be blamed for this, etc. We are talking about them looking at their lives and looking at affirming scriptures that promote, say, you are equal, you are valued, etc. And they're ready for to speak to each other, with each other, and dialogue together on the six weeks. So that's kind of the standard process. And you can see the different kind of um, the sessions on a weekly basis. And I have hand handouts because I can't just come from a conference and there's a lot of excess and I don't want to you know, waste them, so I'll give it to you. Um, so this is the standard process. And third week, like I said, after each week, six weeks, the junior champions, that's the end of the cycle. They debrief together uh, because they do a joint session on the six weeks. They debrief their project officer, the local church leader, about the dynamics between them as a man and woman facilitator. But also they take two weeks off and then they recruit again for new set of uh, members. We do not, the people who go through the process do not train again. It's the gender champions again who recruit new people. Uh, standard, you know, kind of minimum eight women, eight men per group, and that's the and maximum ten women. And if somebody drops out, they can't join again because it's a process. They have to wait to the next cycle. So that's the kind of standard process of <coughs> transform masculinity next slide. Why a faith-based intervention? I think Jean highlighted some, um, uh, you know, kind of key reflections. Next slide. Um, so we've just recently kind of so Chia Fund is doing, you know, multiple projects around GBV, and one of the projects is uh, through WorkWorks Consortium, um, funded by DFID. And one of the best lines that we did in uh, this is in Ituri province in the east of the RC, yeah, and we've just kind of had the report that came out, uh, uh, and some of the key, really key for interesting findings is that like 83 percent, 80 say that you know faith engagement or affiliation is important to them. These are both Muslim and Christian communities that we are working in. Uh, and also one of the consistent things that was highlighted through the analysis is that the faith engagement came out as one of the most significant correlation with reduced experience of IPV among women in the last 12 months, but also just in terms of also empowering attitudes for women. Like the belief that women can say no to sex. There's more, much more high you know, within women who that they've actually engaged in faith. And the same with men as well. And also women who, you know, who have actually engaged in faith were more likely to just say, I feel it's not justified in any way. You know, and also, again, like I said, they can say it is uh, to sex, but also say that joint decision making is much more, you know, effective way in relationships. But also one of the key things to be found is that men also reported less, they were less likely to perpetrate violence in the last 12 months against a partner if they had active their engagement. It was, it was also not necessarily straightforward correlation, but it was men who are actually engaged in faith, alcohol usage was less, and therefore they were less likely to perpetrate violence against their partner in the last 12 months. But also they would also have this equitable attitude in terms of caregiving, in terms of household work, but also mostly saying hey, if a woman can say no sex if she you know, doesn't want. And there were no justifications. Usually that comes with a list. Hey, yes, she can say no, but there are these hundred lists under these conditions, but these were men who were saying she can, you know, she wants to. So again, this is for both Christian and uh, Muslim communities. Our own research, like most of the work that we do in before we implement, we do performance studies, and we actually start listening to men and women, and in, with the hope of adapting our intervention. One of the key things that we found is that faith leaders and communities, not just faith leaders, and the communities themselves. I think in terms of a normative intervention, social knowledge, it's important to acknowledge that it's not just necessarily a faith leaders. Most times the sanctions are from the communities themselves. So it is faith leaders and communities play an important role in terms of influencing gender norms, whether positively or negatively. Uh, people's understanding of scriptures, not theology necessarily, because most times people don't even read the Bible because they can't read in the communities, some of the communities that we work in. They understand the application of scriptures as it is sometimes, as you know, as really literally as it is, influence their behaviors and practices. You know, so sometimes there are translations that says God created man, they actually believe God created man, not mankind. You know, so some of the translations also play into this conversation as well. They play you know, a huge role in terms of shaping people's behaviors and practices. Uh, but also to justify male dominance, you know, gender inequality, saying that women woman is taken out of a rib, therefore she's you know, inferior to men and men are superior. But also one of the recent exciting things for us, passages, which is a project funded by you that I'll talk about it, uh, from Kinshasa Code Survey, also says one of the key reference groups for social norms around IPV and uptake of family planning is uh, faith leaders and communities. So I think 
In terms of why a faith-based approach, I think if, yes, we live in a world that's predominantly affiliated to some form of religion or faith tradition, but also faith engagement and spirituality is important for people. And we need to engage with people from that point of view. Right? Next slide, please. So some of the key features of our intervention, I think why I've done this, you know, workshops and trainings for a long time and for with uh, Kepon and this. And sometimes I, except for the standard debates around women's thoughts every first day of the training, I've not faced resistance. And I feel it's because we've included scripture-based reflection. Because most times people justify it and denounce saying this is a Western concept, it's not compatible with our faith and culture. And we, I think the use of scriptures and engagement, critical reflection from scriptures, we brought the conversation about gender equality within people's parameters of faith, understanding of faith. They're like, oh, actually, this is not mutually exclusive. This is, these are principles of the faith itself. And also creating spaces for safe spaces for uh, reflections. One of the things that I found more meaningful is that people feeling open enough to talk about their personal challenges and experiences as men and women. And one of the key things for me in the work that I'm doing as a man myself is that the counter practices. Just because I'm like, hey, we need to work on GBV, women's rights and empowerment, my privilege and power doesn't go away. You know, so how do you promote accountable practices? How do we hold men and uh, men accountable? But specifically, we are working with leaders who are predominantly men themselves. How do you promote accountable practices? That they are accountable themselves and people around them. So, and I think one of the key things for this intervention is the accountable practices. And then also the continuous process of refresh, uh, refresher training and coaching. We tried, you know, uh, refresher training, it doesn't really work. We tried to move into a more coaching and mentoring uh, uh, plan with uh, gender champions and faith leaders themselves. How do you continue to reflect on these things with them? How do you join with these people? And also, the standard intervention is modeled after that life of a church or a mosque. They meet regular, you know, every week. So the sessions are short, like two hours a week, six weeks. We try to model after that so that it's not a burden on them. We do not get involved in organizing the session. These communities themselves organize organically to meet together. Next slide, please. Where it's being ruled out, as you can see here, yeah. yeah. How many more times? You have five minutes. Okay, cool. awesome. Um, yeah, so these are the countries that we are saying. When I say pilot, you know, it's in initial stages, we are, uh, but also in terms of intervention models, we're looking at integrated models in where we're looking at GBV and family planning, GBV and peace building in, in these countries. Next slide, please. What changes are happening? Next slide. Um, in yeah, so just in terms of, uh, you know, one of the things, some of the things that we're saying is from our monitoring data, our panel visits, panel visits, uh, some projects have panel visits which are continuous, uh, you know, focus groups, uh, key informant interviews with faith leaders, gender champions, their partners uh, throughout the life of the project, but also like from passages, ethnography, uh, and some of the monitoring data, et cetera, is that, that faith leaders are actively becoming more engaged in terms of preaching from the pulpit, uh, speaking out against IPV, um, and also giving space for people to share the testimonies, et cetera, et cetera, right? But also in terms of couples' behaviors themselves, like, you know, uh, some of the things that monitoring data that's coming out of passages, which is in Kinshasa, is that there were, there were people from the intervention sites uh, more, twice more likely, you know, twice calling the hotline for planning services and twice more than the control sites. And people from passages projects, the, the intervention sites, were the people who were calling the hotline mostly. And people from the intervention sites are 70% of the part, you know, members who are accessing some bank services. But also in terms of other behaviors, you're seeing changing roles. You're seeing like, you know, pastors accompanying women to legal services, healthcare services, working with survivors themselves, but also looking at, you know, looking at their own lives. I've had pastors, you know, kind of make public concession about their own, you know, uh, relationship with their partners in terms of non-consenting sexual behaviors with their, you know, wives, et cetera. And you can see that there are so many different changes that are taking place in communities. Um, yeah. Sorry for rushing. So just quickly to say, the transfer masculinity is adaptation funded by UCID. It's a faith-based intervention to you know, reduce IPV and increase family planning methods in Kinshasa. Um, next slide. So it's funded by UCID. I'll make a plug there. Please <laughs> uh, 2015 to 2020, uh, as you can see, the consortium led by George Stone Institute uh, Georgetown University's Institute of Reproductive Health, and then we have FHS 360, John Hopkins, uh, and Publishing Services International, Save the Children and Care Fund. Um, yeah, you can see the goals, etc. I just want to talk about the intervention. So, so the intervention is um, 
an adaptation of the transfer masculinity standard process. We're looking at uh, an IPV intervention that's adapted to include family planning protection. So the standard six weeks sessions become eight weeks. We have two additional weeks that will reflect on family planning. Now these gender champions do not give, teach family planning methods because they are not you know, textually sound on that. They talk scriptural reflections that make it okay for the PSI, ASF PSI healthcare workers, uh, workers to come in and give you the family planning methods. Right. So again, so the service linkage for this uh, intervention is from ASF PSI, who are the service pro providers. They have clinics in the in the uh, communities that we're working in, and they come in and do a health talk at the end of the eight week session. It's an RCT uh, in 17 Protestant congregations in Kinshasa, of, of which eight are experimental and nine are control sites. Yeah. So the question that we're exploring in terms of social norms is that to what extent does a gender norm intervention to reduce the sense can be increased as we use among newly married couples and first time parents. Okay. Next one. Yeah, fear of change. I put this in in case that we circulate this slide and you can, you know, see the pathways. Okay, so not just for me to reiterate. Again, as you can see, the standard interventions, the faith leaders, you know, champions, new new married couples, we also have the piece that we are intentional about diffusion. So how is this message diffusion in the entire complications themselves? And as you can see, we have the week seven and eight additional to the six weeks on our TV, which focuses on you know, some planning reflections. So what are we saying? I just talked about it. You know, the young adults from the experimental sites are two times more likely, you know, two times, two twice more accessing the hotline services, et cetera. But also we have this interesting uh, ethnography study that also we have ethnographers who are going to the congregations and the community dialogues, et cetera, on a rotational basis, they're also seeing the pastors preaching more sermons in support of the uh, And there's more um, you know, testimonies of couples who are sharing you know, as a way of diffusing this. And what we can see is that you know, uh, 97, we just started in uh, February, the intervention, rolling out the intervention. So we've seen 97 sermons preached from that now and 38 testimonies. We're also tracking the number of members who come into this congregation. So these are not actual number of people, but these are people contacts, I'm told. Like, so it's 27,000 people, but they're not 20,000 unique people. They're people who are coming back to the church, hopefully. You know. um, so that's what you're seeing, and it's exciting for us, because I think one, one of the things that's missing from our faith-based interventions are evidence, right? So I think it's exciting to work with exciting new partners, like you know, Institute of Practice Health, uh, PSI, and to really make a case for the work that we do on with faith -based. I mean, it's not easy. It's not you know, you know, kind of all hunky-dory. But it's challenging, but also it's doable. And I think that's one of the things that we are saying, as if we can effectively engage with them, acknowledging their harmful practices that they promote, and you know, that's something. So just quickly to talk about challenges. Challenges, we talk about, um, of course, with, with faith leaders, they are very influential and how, you know, hold power. How do you engage in a meaningful way? You know, like promoting accountable practices, as I said. Other thing is like, how does this message cascade? So if you take a cascading approach, sometimes it gets distorted. So how do you can continuously reinforce some of these messages in a way that it's possibly made for them in this community. So it's not distorted. They're like, hey, we need to support survivors, but hey, now let's protect women, right? That's what women need now. So let's tell them how to wear, what to wear, where to go, et cetera. So those are kind of things that we want to challenge. One of the key things that I'm finding is in terms of scaling it up. Now, most of the training, I'm doing it because people say, you have to come back. You know, I think it's challenging because I think trainings are more meaningful when we are able to offer personal reflection. And you know, I think one of the things that I find useful is that because I come from such a interesting background, I'm able to give, give a lot of reflections around family, conflict, sexual abuse, and different kinds of things that's happening in my life. And I think people always reciprocate. How do we do it in, in, in a scale-up way? How do we scale that up? How do you train master trainers who are able to offer personal reflections? That's one of the things that we're finding really challenged. Uh, you know, it's like we can train trainers but it doesn't really relate to personal behavior change and they're not able to offer personal reflections. So that's some of the challenges that we're dealing with at the moment. Thank you so much. I think that's the next slide is thank you. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> and more information, please visit the site. Thank you, don't go away in case we have any clarifying, do we have clarifying questions? Wait, I have one. So, because we were flashing signs at you, you went through this a little fast. Can you talk a little bit about the refresher training you said that goes on so it's not just a one-off and then yeah. see you, hope it goes okay? Yeah. So, after the end of the first cycle, we uh, have a refresher training for the faith leaders themselves and the church champions. So, most of the, the, the understanding there is 
to create a space for people to share challenges from the first increment in the first cycle. Uh, challenges around logistics, challenges of participation, challenges about the concepts themselves and what people are struggling with, but also create a space for them to share with one another you know, the challenges that they have. And we also collect some of the most challenging conversations they've had in terms of the concepts as a way of building it into the program of the pressure training. But as a way of continuous process, following on from the refresher training, what we have said to the, you know, we mandated the, or created a structure with the project officers that every week, every month when they do their visits to the community, they spend one and a half hours with search and the champion for speech and the faith leaders to reinforce some of the concepts. So yes, that's also part of the ongoing refresher training. And then also, like, I think after three cycles, we've also had refresher training to kind of come back and say, I think some people were finding the fun planning uh, sessions, reflections challenging because we are very used to doing the IPV stuff. The fun planning uh, reflections from the, it's a new toolkit that we've developed only for the passages. So that, that will keep reinforcing those concepts. Okay. Is there another question? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thanks very much for that. I'm Willa Gerber with PRB. Do you ever get the question or do you proactively address the question of when you're dealing with this at a faith-based level and, oh, by the way, all the leaders are men? We do. I mean, we do a talk about it. We talk about women's leadership. Like, So one of the ways we say is like, as an alternative to this harmful set of norms and practices about being a man and you know leadership, et cetera, we promote the, you know in Christian communities we talk about Jesus Christ as a mother, right? Like for being a man, being a leader, working with people who are considered vulnerable. And one of the conversations that we talk about how do you create spaces for women's leadership? What is your role as a male leader? We talk about the absence of female leadership here, and 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 use you know uh, the example of Jesus who was you know a servant leader, creating spaces for the people to speak out. So. It's, so we talk about actively engaged with that, like how do we promote women's leadership as well, which is an important thing. And 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 to see, I mean, in the work that I do, I've seen a lot of female leaders, some of the most strong churches, congregations, most largest churches I've worked with sometimes are female leaders. And we talk about how do we create more spaces, active spaces for them to talk about this as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Joanna Kutcher Chen from World Relief. And you mentioned um, the use of scriptures, right? Um, but you also mentioned working in both Muslim majority contexts and Christian. So, that first part when you're working with faith leaders, my question is, is do you have Muslim contextualized versions? And then does that go all the way through as well? Or is it, how does that look? Um, so most of the work that we've done with Islamic leaders and imams is in the context of predominantly Christian communities with minority Muslims, right? So what we usually do is we ha invite the imams that who are part of the group to say, this is what the Bible is saying. Can you, you know, reflect from the Quran or the Hadith that scriptures that correlate to these principles and values, and they bring in them. So we've included some of them in our, in our, in our toolkit, but we do not, you know encourage our trainers to put that out because we are Christian organizations going into spaces that and we don't have a credibility to talk about. We the most effective way of use is that bringing in partners who have done this work in the community. I was just recently in Iraq where we had similar thing with, with but Yazidis, Islamic leaders, uh, Islamic communities and Christians together. What we do is we ask them to then reflect about scriptures from their own traditions and faith. We don't even talk about Christian scriptures at that time then we break them into groups and say, can you reflect on scriptures, all traditions, all Stories because uh, your cities don't have scriptures, they are oral tradition from you know to talk or reflect on these things and then have a conversation about similarities but also challenges that we face. People like this is what scriptures are saying, but after in practice and theory, you know, in, in application, we are missing the point by having those reflections. We are working in Iraq at the moment for an adaptation to Islamic and your cities, so that will be a full adaptation of the tool looking at scriptures that are from uh, Quran and Hadith that reflect the same model and also in Nigeria because I think that's the space. But we will have to look at partners who are local partners working in Islamic communities who can do this work. Thank you very much, Prabha. And you okay? You okay? Well, we'll have more space for dialogue, but thank you. So our next speaker is Mary Linehan.
she is the Senior Technical Director at IMA World Health. She's responsible for technical oversight, research, and M&E. She has over 20 years' experience implementing and managing international public health programs, including maternal and child health, nutrition, and infectious diseases. Prior to joining IMA, she served as infectious disease team lead for the USAID Jakarta Office of Health and as co-director of USAID's neglect, Neglected Tropical Disease Control Program at RTI International. She holds master's degrees in public health and in international affairs from Columbia University. And the title, which you should have on your agenda, is Providing Services to Survivors of Sexual and Gender-Based Violence in the DRC, Addressing More Than Physical Trauma. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. You can go ahead to the next slide. So I am going to be speaking about uh, an IMA project in the DRC, but I'd like to give you a little bit of background. IMA World Health is a faith-based organization that develops, uh, that works with developing communities uh, globally to face their public health problems. We were founded in 1960 and currently have offices in Haiti, Tanzania, Kenya, South Sudan, and the DRC in Indonesia. Our mission is to build healthier communities, um, and we've been in the DRC since 2000. Our main goal is to create health and well-being for all. Next slide. So, background for the DRC. For over two years, the DRC has been plagued by armed conflict and the humanitarian crisis. This has been caused by multiple factors, including lots of involvement from neighboring countries and ongoing war. Since 1996, an estimated 5.4 million people have died as a result of the war, and over 2 million individuals have been displaced. The war was officially declared over in 2003, but there continues to be an awful lot of conflict and instability and the presence of militia groups fighting the Congolese forces. Uh, as you probably know, STBV is a tool of war. The militia groups and the Congolese army are guilty of these war crimes, human rights abuses, rape, and other gender-based violence. And in Eastern DRC, gender-based violence affects about 40% of women and 23% of men. So I would just like to reiterate what we all know, and that is STBV is associated with serious adverse medical, psychological, and economic and social outcomes, not just for survivors, but also their families and the communities. Next slide. So the Ushindi Project is a USAID-funded project for about $24.5 million. It was funded from 2010 to 2017. We're ending actually at the end of this month. Uh, we have implemented through partners, local partners, Heal Africa, Ponzi Foundation, PPSFP, and they have provided, um, they are local faith-based organizations largely who have uh, established networks and who have therefore been able to provide a degree of variation experimentation to the life of the project. We also have the partner, the ABA Roley. We work in 13 health zones, 108 health areas, 1,100 villages with a population of about 1.6 million, and over the course of the project have reached over 30,000 survivors. And you can see on this map where we cover, and I'd just like to point out that this geographic coverage is spotty. This doesn't in any way suggest that this is the extent of the problem or that we've met all the needs. Like any donor, USAID has limited funds, and like any implementer, we were restricted by the funding we had, and our funding varied over the years. So we are happy to have covered what we did, but we recognize there's a tremendous amount of unmet need. Next slide. So we did a survey to indicate to, to determine what kind of violence we were looking at. And as you can see, we have, have a breakdown here, and it is 60% uh, rape, but that's a lot of gender-based violence, which is not only rape. And that really helped us to inform the kinds of interventions that we needed to engage in. And I'd like to just uh, read you the words of one of our survivors to give you an idea of the kind of uh, people that we were dealing with. One of our, our, our survivors said, I was, I was traveling to a village two days walk away from my home to sell palm oil. I was with 10 other women and six teenage boys from my village. On the second day, we set out around 7 a.m., and soon after that, we were surprised by two armed men. They took us into the forest, and they raped us one after the other. 
And when they were done with us, they took the young men and put a gun to their heads and forced them also to have sex with us. This was a great dishonor, and these young men had been children to us. I didn't tell my husband what happened because I was afraid he would leave me. But two months later, an armed group came to my village and took four men by gunpoint to transfer their bags. My husband was among them, and I have not seen him again. So we're talking about uh, not just serious trauma, but watching even more serious trauma, and then being part of the collapse of families and communities. Next slide. So the Ushindi Project is actually based on a word that means to overcome. And uh, as again, SGBD is associated with serious medical and uh, psychological trauma. So we focused on ways to support survivors to overcome their trauma, the ones that they've experienced and when they've observed, and to reintegrate into their communities, their families, and their own lives. And one of the key approaches that we used was local faith leaders and community groups that we call Noyo Communicare. And they serve as the main point of contact, main entree to our survivors. They identify survivors, they provide psychological support, and they refer them to the appropriate services depending on what, what kind of services they require. They play a critical role in the education of the community for prevention and response for women's rights and for family planning. They also serve as advocates um, and a conduit for uh, survivors to access the services uh, that they might need that we, that the, the, the NOYO themselves are not able to provide. So our strategies include medical. We provide uh, PEP kits for HIV AIDS prevention, treatment of SDIs, emergency contraception, fistula treatment, and treatment of vaginal prolapse. We've provided services, psychological services, over 30,000, and we particularly have uh, been successful using a cognitive process. Uh, and indeed, our psychological services focus on psychological recovery after an incident and create an environment for the survivor uh, in which they will be referred to or encouraged to seek the necessary legal and uh, medical services as well as socioeconomic assistance. We use two types of uh, psychological services. One is confidential one-on-one -on -one services, and one is the active listening and counseling and relaxation uh, exercises. We actually found these to be extraordinarily uh, useful. Legal services were provided to, us, uh, to, to survivors. Um, 16,000 people received counseling, and we were able to bring over 3,000 cases to court. We found that mobile legal services were extremely important. We need to be able to bring services, providers, uh, counselors directly to people rather than expect them to come in and seek them. It's, it's, uh, it, was, it was very, very challenging to get people to actually reach out to look for support for legal services. Next slide. We provided socioeconomic support. Uh, we found that about 45,000 people in the village participated in village level savings and loan associations, which uh, gave out grants and allowed people to um, start small businesses, uh, develop gardens. Uh, clearly, this was more than all of the survivors we treated. So we were able to open it up to broader families and community members. It was extraordinarily important to people, pro potentially provided uh, opportunities for improved nutrition, and schooling, and health needs. Um, clearly, its popularity had a lot to do with just how poor the population was. We also did a lot of capacity building. Um, we trained uh, providers, healthcare providers, about 5,500 of them, um, uh, in the care and prevention of uh, SGBV. Uh, we worked with the legal workers and also community workers. Engaged in large-scale community education campaigns. Um, this was both uh, events and uh, mass media campaigns. We strengthened uh, organizations, and this was a matter of giving people training, uh, developing their capacity to work with uh, survivors, and also providing support to the grants uh, that we gave uh, so they could comply with USAID regulations. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the strength of our model. As Jean said very nicely, faith communities contribute to the trauma, stigma, and problems that, that uh, survivors face, they also reinforce gender inequity. My feeling is, I think that if we are not dealing with these groups, we are in fact uh, failing to address one of the underlying problems. It is true that they have the trust of the community, they have moral stature, they have networks, 
through their through their faith-based organizations. They are also uh, groups that are by default in place and uh, potentially serve as a source of moral guidance uh, and means of addressing the spiritual and cultural aspects of gender-based violence that medical services are just not prepared to do. We also found that our model was able to effectively um, reach the range of services that we found our, our clients needing. Instead of just uh, medical services, instead of just with psychological services, we found that they needed a mix and that they actually needed a great deal of uh, emotional support, um, group work, uh, relaxation exercises, things that made them feel better about being in their own bodies. Our approach also supports directly the DRC's health system in this very resource poor and fragmented, uh, fragile environment. We also feel like our um, approach is very strong in building the capacity of local organizations and local communities and dealing with the needs of their survivors uh, in their own homes and in their communities. So for recommendations and lessons learned, <clears throat> We really feel strongly that FBOs, especially local organizations, should be leveraged to expand STBD services. They can extend the reach of services. They do have uh, impact on cultural norms and, and beliefs, and they are more likely to uh, provide a sustained uh, change and, and some impact. We found that income generation was an extraordinarily important part of it. It really helps to reduce stigma and ostracism, and it can engage communities, can serve as a platform for engaging communities in the discussion about gender-based violence and equity. Further, we'd like to highlight the need for additional research to target services to specific age groups, uh, genders, and um, to identify unmet need among the most highly stigmatized and hidden at-risk groups. We are very clear, and I think that Lynn's uh, evaluation report later will, will conclude that we know that we were not able to meet all of the needs. We probably weren't even able to identify all of the needs. There's a lot of work that we would, we would propose to do to further look at what the specific needs of subpopulations are, and then to target pilot interventions to look at exactly what kinds of services will work better for them. Uh, and I think that this particularly uh, includes male victims and adolescents who are more likely to need different kinds of approaches. We also believe that creating a broader community-wide discussion about the beliefs and practices and norms that contribute to gender inequity and therefore gender-based violence are extremely important if we're going to actually ever prevent it instead of treating it. So I'd like to thank USAID for its generosity and thank you all for listening. So I should say we're going to go on to Lynn Lowry. So maybe we, unless you have a specific um, question, clarifying question for Mary, we'll just keep going. Yeah. Okay. So this really is a twofer on you, Shindy. We were fortunate to have both Mary and Lynn Lowry. Lynn was here. I shockingly found out this morning about seven years ago to do some of her evaluation re research on the DRC on a different project. Felt like just a couple years ago, but uh, to introduce her, she is the Senior Director of Health Research and Evaluation for Overseas Strategic Consulting Limited. She has more than 20 years of experience conducting mixed methods research on humanitarian related topics across the globe and has worked in more than two dozen countries, many that were either conflict or post-conflict settings. Prior to her current position, she was director of the Initiative on Global Women's Health in the Division of Women's Health and on the faculty at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School for 20 years. She was an associate at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and associate professor at Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. Dr. Lowry earned her medical degree at East Carolina University School of Medicine, a Master of Science in Public Health from UNC Chapel Hill, and a Master of Science in Epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health. Her topic, in addition to you, Shindy, obviously, is using data to understand prevention and response to sexual violence in Eastern Europe. Good morning, everybody. 
So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and I'm going to talk about the complications that you see in survivors and why it's important to program um, for these types of issues. So first, um, a little bit about OSC. Many people don't know us. We actually uh, specialize in strategic behavior change communication. We have 25 years of implementing research, um, mostly USAID projects in over 40 countries. In DRC, we actually lead the SBCC piece in the Integrated Health Project. We're now also leading the SBCC piece in Malawi on ONSE. And then we have our research and evaluation, which I was asked to head up about three years ago. Um, this is to basically come up with statistically robust studies that look at baselines, midlines, impact evaluations, because you can't do communication um, without knowing what you have to start and making sure that you're doing better. We were contracted by IMA and Ushindi to complete the impact evaluation and the baseline for the new uh, health zones where Ushindi had then extended. So what you're going to hear about is basically from these two pieces. So first, looking at the baseline, uh, Ushindi extended into Katana, Wali, Kali, and Karasimbi. I don't know if anybody, is, besides some of our speakers, um, these are conflict areas in Eastern DRC. They're not as easy to get to. In fact, when I did the, the previous study in 2010, which were statistics that Mary talked about, I actually couldn't get to Wali Kali because of the conflict at the time. So this time I get to go back and look at these. So methodology, I'm not going to go greatly into this. If you want to know about this, I can talk about it more. But basically, it's a multi-stage clustered randomized study. Why do I do that? Because you can interview 900 households and then extend it to the entire population of whatever your sampling frame is. So in this case, this study represents 727,000 people um, using the way that we did this. If you'll notice, we didn't implement in every, uh, we didn't do the study in every uh, health area within the health zones. The reason being, Eastern DRC has survey fatigue. If you go into a village and you say to the chief, we need your permission to, to do a survey. They'll say, are you bringing services to us? And if you say no, they say, okay, fine, goodbye. So we tried to um, keep to the areas that we were implementing, which was most of the health zones, but understand that there are health, health um, areas that are not represented. We did both a quantitative and a qualitative study, as I normally do. And let me give you some of these results. Um, I'm not going to go over the demographics in depth. I have a lot of slides, but just if you want to, what was interesting and what was a surprise, if there's always a surprise when I do research, if you look at the household income, um, it was about $69 for women, $84 for men. What was more interesting was there was no discrepancy between survivors and non-survivors. So if you looked at household incomes, they were actually the same. When we looked at uh, sexual gender-based violence, um, which includes physical, psychological violence, bisexual means, if you look at the numbers, um, if you remember the other study um, that I did in 2010, it was 39% uh, 30, in women, 23% in men. If you look at the numbers, it's 31 in women, now 32% in men. It doesn't mean that the number went up for men. It actually has the same confidence intervals cross, so it's the same number, essentially. So basically, it's 30% of men, 30% of women and 61% of children. This is the first time that we had actually done a study looking at children. If you then separate out and you take only the sexual violence, not all the other forms of gender-based violence, it's 11.8% <laughs> among women, 3.1% among men, and 11% among children. But again, one of, as I told you, one of the reasons that I do this type of work is to extrapolate it to a population. So now you know how many people are in those three health zones that you need to reach. 30,000 women, 12,000 men, and 59,000 children. When you look at intimate partner violence, it's about 20%. Um, and then if you look at lifetime rates, they're exactly the same as they were in 2010. Again, these are areas that have not had programming. Um, therefore, you wouldn't expect it to be much better, with the exception of Wally Kali. Among women, the odds for sexual gender-based violence were 80% higher with alcohol abuse and in primary education. Um, why would you think that you would have higher rates with primary education? Again, school-based gender-based violence is quite high. Walking to school is a risk. Therefore, it's higher. Looking at intimate partner violence, um, it's normalized, it's accepted. I think the other speakers have um, spoken a lot about this. The most common reason that they said 
that intimate partner violence was used for women was because women were too prideful or because women stated that they refused sex and therefore they were subject to beatings. When you looked at children in the communities, and this is some, we use local data collectors, I sat um, in the community and watched the children mimic adults by, by hitting, throwing things at, at each other and repeating, I will beat you um, whenever there's a disagreement. So now they've become, and this is different from when I started many years ago, you didn't see as much of that among children, but now we're beginning to see that. Again, when you look at the gender roles, and this is why it's very important to look at gender roles, it's not just men who feel these things, it's also women. So you've got both men and women believing that these gender roles or norms are accepted and they've been normalized and okay. Looking at trafficking, this was the first time, they're the first um, prevalent statistics ever in DRC looking at trafficking. If you look at the forms, it was a third labor, a, four, a third debt bondage, and a third sex trafficking. We asked about recruitment and why they stayed. Recruitment was basically personal security. Many of the men were abducted. Family, families actually subjected people to trafficking because they, were off, they could get food for their kids, food for their children, um, or they could get labor and money. And they stayed for personal security because their families were threatened. And the third most common reason was because they needed to eat, um, which was another one of those surprising findings. When you look at the prevalence rate, it's about 18,000 women, 12,000 men, and 24,000 children. Um, many of these are around the mining sites, but there's other forms that are happening, and it's not just mining. Child violence, um, when you looked at the three different health zones, 69% in, uh, in Karasimbi, all the way to 45% in Wali Kali, all of these are the forms that we use, rape, forced marriage, abduction, no schooling for girls, et cetera. Again, remember SGBV is the umbrella of all the different forms. And then when you extrapolated it, so SGBV affects 299,000 children in three homes <coughs> alone. It doesn't even cover the rest. When you looked at child sexual violence, the highest rates were in Wally Kali, 20%. This is no surprise given the conflict that was happening there. The UN is finally there. And again, when I did this in 2010, I wasn't able to get there. Substance abuse, I think this is a highly overlooked issue. Um, alcohol and drug abuse were common. They were more common among men, uh, about 40% versus 20% among women, but women are still using at a much higher rate than I remember from 25 years ago. Kerasimbi had the highest rates. They were using a qualitative study. We were able to figure out what all the different names are. These are some of the, the names. They're primarily using home brews, so they're taking wine, banana, whatever they can do to make these white liquor home brews and beers. And qualitatively, they told us that substance abuse precipitates violence. It's also a consequence of violence. In other words, you numb your pain by drinking. Um, and I'll show you some other interesting data that we got from this. When we look at the symptoms of depression and anxiety, if you look at those with sexual violence in blue and those with, sex, with no sexual violence, um, you can see the rates are stagger, staggeringly high. 62% have depression and anxiety compared to those who are 20%. Let me just warn you, this is not cause and effect. The study doesn't do cause and effect. I'm telling you that it's associated, but it doesn't mean that the gender-based violence itself is what causes this. There are many other reasons to, be, to have depression and anxiety. Um, the numbers are, are large. It's 50,000 women, 17,000 men who make criteria for depression and anxiety. There are no differences between men and, men and women when you look at the rates, but the rates sort of trend higher for women. If the study was probably two to three times larger, we may actually see that they're higher among women. PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, again, this is not a diagnosis of PTSD. It's the symptoms that would suggest there's PTSD. Doing PTSD assessments are much broader than just sort of doing a, a, a symptom checklist. Uh, like depression, there were no differences between men and women, but again, the rate sort of trended a little bit higher among women. Sexual violence was the only uh, form of SGBV that actually had a, a statistically significant difference. And you see, for those who had violence, 65% had symptoms of PTSD versus 14 or 15%. Um, who had no sexual violence. And then remember I told you that alcohol was an issue. If you look at the odds of sexual violence, 
85%, you had an 85% higher odds for having uh, sexual violence if you had PTSD symptoms and alcohol use. So that means you could go backwards. If you can go into any other clinic, an MNCH clinic when somebody presents for family planning, if you can do a PTSD screen and an alcohol screen, you might be able to identify reluctant reporters um, because there is a pretty high rate of people that will not report gender-based violence. So at a suicide attempts, 15% overall, again, every form of gender-based violence actually um, is statistically significant and has higher rates of suicide attempts. And then looking at the impact evaluation, so what we did was we had to go back post hoc and look at how to do Shindy do over the last five years. Knowing all that we know now about what gender-based violence um, has, is associated, we had to do a desk review, qualitative interviews, a quantitative data collection. They had uh, originally used the LQAS um, methodology to look at changes in attitudes and myths, and a quantitative data analysis um, using data from patient encounters. Medical impact, despite some data limitations, there were some problems with where things were entered, how they were entered, such as somebody's name was misspelled, you couldn't tie it to another um, time when they came into the clinic for psychosocial. Um, but it looked like that the actual presentation of time to services had increased, so the number of survivors coming to care within 72 hours had gone up, um, which suggests that the campaigns by the NOYO, the NOYO Communitaire, the community volunteers, including some of the faith-based um, folks that were able to give information to the community, A, you need to get in 72 hours if you want to be able to be treated um, completely. The outside sourcing model for pet kits, pet kits are, you know, stock outs are a problem. Um, IMA created this really unique and um, different way of being able to source all of these things, actually packaging the pet kits and putting them in the clinics. Um, that was cost effective and efficient and should be replicated by others to make sure that pet kits are available. Among the survivors interviewed, it was common knowledge that medical services were free. When we asked um, all of our respondents, they understood that it was free. That was not an issue, whereas other services, if you ask them about other types of services for general medical care, they, they feel that they're um, for pay. There was a higher than expected rate of pregnant survivors. This is not quantitative data, but I will tell you that it seems that pregnant survivors showed up more than you would expect. With a rate, you expect about 4% of survivors to come up with a pregnancy. The rate was about 20%. So these are sort of the worst case that are referring themselves. Um, and that creates an issue because you also have to then refer them for HIV services. Um, so 2.5% of the survivors in the database needed PMTCT. The nurses were well trained, they followed the national treatment guidelines, and they actually stated they felt more confident in recognizing and treating survivors. When I had done the study in 2010 and we talked to medical staff, they said, you know, this isn't something we get trained in in school, we wouldn't even know how to begin to ask um, or to even recognize someone who may be presenting with SGBV but just may not be saying it. Looking at the psychosocial impact, survivors were very aware that the NOYO and the psychosocial services available to them, they were heavily used by survivors. And survivors that we interviewed stated, I felt better, I felt better, I felt better. There, of course, was that 10 to 5 to 10 percent that didn't feel better. Those are the ones that are now getting CPT. Safe houses were also established. These were sort of like a one-stop place to get treatment, to get services, to get information. They were important for combined service access, access and represented a safe, calm, and welcoming place for survivors. The only thing the survivors had issue with was there was a big, giant sign that said on the road for survivors of sexual abuse. So that was one of the things that has actually been changed um, in the new program. And I think, you know, it wasn't, you know, I can't blame. I think you have to have a place where you can't just rely on recruiting them in the community. You want the reluctant reporters to also know there's something there for you to go to. So in some ways, I think it's a mixed bag. 
Lay counselors in particular were heavily used by survivors and well liked. They were well trained and were the mainstay of the program. Psychologists were present for cases time after time when I talked to the Noyo and they said I had a problem with X number of, of the patients that I was treating, I was able to get to a psychologist very quickly. And there were psychologists that were doing refresher trainings, keeping up with the lay counselors, so that was quite good. When we looked at VSLA, remember again I said that there were no difference between the monthly household income among survivors and non-survivors. Um, social economic assistance was the least arm used. Um, literacy, in fact, 0.1% of survivors stated they used literacy. literacy. VSLA, based on the records that we had, it was 1.3%, although I think a lot of it was not reported. Um, so it may not it may not may not be the case given if you look at the number of VSLAs that were created. They also used uh, foster families for kids who um, were orphaned or or lost from their families or their families abandoned them. Um, they were not as effective. Youth clubs have had an anecdotal impact on the awareness of children's rights and sexual violence among youth, including early marriage. The kids really liked these youth clubs. They were doing very unique plays. They were discussing a lot of issues. The one good thing was that they had adults in the room to be able to sort of moderate what they talked about to make sure that the information was correct. Other needs not met included schooling. Again, a higher education gives you um, a higher standard of health um, and trades that they didn't have, so they were working in other people's fields. So for instance, a lot of the survivors said, after I was raped, after I'd gone through services, I couldn't get a job, so I had to go work in somebody else's field, or I had to sell beer. So they put themselves in situations where they were now, again, subject to a higher risk for gender-based violence. The justice impact, um, ABA needs to do a more in-depth analysis, but looking at the data that we had, survivors interviewed were not, not as aware of the legal services as much as the other services. More than half of the people that we interviewed, 56% had brought cases to the legal clinic and were pursued. 21% of the cases with a judgment heralds actually a significant um, accomplishment by ABA. There are some places where the, the um, cases brought are less than 1%, so this is quite good. Anecdotally, the fact that sexual violence is prosecuted and sentences have been given created a fear in the community. When we talk to people in the community and we talk to men or we talk to women, they would say, nobody's going to rape in this community because so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so went to jail for this. So it did create some sense. Whether that translates to quantitative data, we're not sure. Um, local chiefs, though, were still mediating cases. They justified that in cases of minors, it's okay because you don't want that family shame. Um, and they were also adjudicating IPV cases. They didn't necessarily adjudicate those sexual violence cases unless it was a minor, which I would argue is not great either. And then there was an issue of weekend liberty. Basically, what the judges were doing was they were saying the person they had put in jail for a presumed rape or someone who had been um, convicted, if they would then say, okay, you've got the weekend, you can go home and visit your parents and they didn't come back. Surprise, surprise. Um, and that was a case for a lot of the perpetrators disappearing. A lot of the women whose cases that had happened to were just thoroughly enraged um, that this was the case. And in some ways, I think this was probably corruption of the system. So in conclusion, SGBV and associated mental health disorders are prevalent. They also have unique cultural factors that put men, women, girls, and boys at risk. It's not just women, it's everybody I call it community violence. It's been normalized and justified. I didn't have time to show you. We had a whole list of cultural norms um, that also have created an environment for SGBV to flourish. Um, SGBV is not a small problem in the area of surveys. It requires urgent and contextualized action. We need to do much better about making sure that we get, A, the reluctant reporters, and getting the word out to other people who not even presenting to care to be able to figure out whether they're um, a survivor or not. And Ishindi has been effective in addressing the overwhelming needs of survivors, but should expand to include men and boys. Again, this is not necessarily an Ushindi problem as much as it could be a donor problem. Uh, donors have to recognize that men and boys are also survivors and quite high in DRC. Better child services, the number of children, or the numbers of children um, is quite high. 
they need to be child specific services like we have youth fam youth youth friendly services we need child specific services for sexual violence um, address we need to address the harmful traditional practices substance abuse I can't say this enough um, and myths concerning rape alcohol is a precipitate of violence it's used for self-treatment for violence and with PTSD symptoms to identify the reluctant reporters and interventions designed to strengthen community mobilization and interpersonal communication will have a positive effect and has had a pos positive effect on any barriers that um, for effective behavior change um, and hopefully to, to decrease some of the forms of gender-based violence. You know, it, it's really hard when you're doing these programs, the donor wants you to decrease the prevalence of gender-based violence. You can only really assess certain forms to look at a decrease, such as intimate partner violence over the last year. Um, if you're looking at lifetime gender violence, it takes another lifetime to decrease that number. So you have to make sure when you're when you're addressing, when you put in your um, your your PMP, what you're actually going to look at, that you look at one that you can actually measure um, in five years. So thank you, um, and I'll be happy to make any clarifications if needed. Cool. One quick clarification for you, and then I have a clarification for Mary. Uh, the age of the children, how did you define children? So they were, we, we didn't interview children specifically. I, that's something that I don't do. We use secondary reporting. So they could be anywhere up to age 21. So, Mary, and thank you, Lynn. I get lost in the prevalence of sexual and gender based violence in the DRC, so I may have missed this. So, what made you, Shindy, a faith based intervention? Why couldn't anybody have done this who was working in the DRC? I know because IMA World Health is a faith, but was there something specifically that IMA World Health brought to you, Shindy, that someone else couldn't have? I think it's an important question. I don't think the answer is that we brought anything that others couldn't have. Um, what we brought, okay, definitely it is important that to us, our, our impact is very much related to the fact that we were faith-based and we worked through local faith-based organizations. The interventions we used are pretty standard. We didn't do anything that others haven't tried. I would say that we probably were more effective in that setting, which is extraordinarily faith-based. The communities are religious and we were therefore able to uh, address appropriately uh, some of the problems in context that they well understood. I think it gave us an edge. I don't think that uh, a group that is sensitive uh, to these issues couldn't have done it without being themselves faith-based, but there's no question that by talking the same language about uh, culture and about religion gives you a huge edge in, in getting people to understand, uh, to, to feel like you understand them and to, that you are there to help them. Uh, I, I, don't, I think that it is less important that you only ex uh, use as faith-based organizations that you've not failed to use them. When they are present, they can be extraordinarily effective. And IMA is able to uh, leverage its faith-based uh, skills, but it was not a faith-based project in its design. USAID didn't say only faith-based organizations can apply for this. They said we need a group that knows how to, that can effectively deal with this. And I think IMA and its faith-based partners have demonstrated they are effective, perhaps overcoming some of the the information that we know about how faith-based organizations and the faith community can, in fact, be the perpetrators. So for me, it's, it's more significant that we were able to, in the context of being labeled perpetrators, still be effective at dealing with these issues. So I actually have two questions. One builds right on this last question, which is, then was there any element of the evaluation that focused on the, the, fo the contribution or the connection of partnering with the faith-based community? That's one. And then we'll get to that. Not in this iteration. Um, we really had to go and, and do the impact evaluation from what we had. Unfortunately, there wasn't a baseline to sort of say, okay, here's what's faith-based, here's what's not. In the new iteration, that will definitely be part of it. Great. Um, and another quick question. The data that you showed on intimate partner violence, 
if I got this right and I wrote it down really quickly, 22.6% of women and 25% of men talked about having experienced intimate partner violence, if I understand that statistic correctly. In which case, can you explain can you explain how maybe the question was posed to men or what kind of experience they talked about? So the intimate partner violence was both physical and sexual. Intimate partner violence, men clearly had more, reported more physical violence. If you look at the rates of women now drinking, and that when we went back and, and asked men who reported intimate partner violence, they said, my wife, you know, she was raped, she drinks, she gets violent when she comes home, she beats me with sticks. So there's a lot of uh, that going on, um, and I think that's why you're seeing it among men as well. I mean, it's 20% of women that are drinking, so that's a large number. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things, just to comment, and then a question, is just that you're right. When you want to look at changing norms, in society, you need to have long term follow up, and the donors have not been very good at providing support for that ongoing data collection. It's an important point to keep making. Um, it was very clear to me that the interventions address survivors, and you very clearly explained the prevalence of violence in the communities and the norms and structural issues around that. And I didn't see the, was there actual interventions like community mobilization or interpersonal communication or community dialogue to affect that norm change? I didn't hear it in the impact, and I, I know that the long-term change. So I just was wondering if you could clarify what the interventions were related to actually community dialogue around normative change. Yeah, so that was largely done by the NOYO and then done with youth and adolescents in the youth clubs. Um, we did have LQ, LQAS data on myths, um, myths uh, rape myths, and some of those improved, but it, was, it varied by area. So in some of the implementation areas where one of the groups was better at doing community mobilization than the other, you saw improvement in myths, particularly uh, victim blaming. So that was the most commonly improved uh, myth that that was that got better, um, but it wasn't everywhere. It was sort of patchy, depending on the health zone and funding. Do we have any questions on that during the discussion? Okay. All right. So, uh, if we can ask all four to come up here. And we will go to a general discussion and maybe get some of our online people involved here. And I should say that when we have all of the approval of the presenters, I will upload all of the PowerPoints and the PDFs to the IGWG website. So you'll get a chance to take a longer look at some of these. So can I start? I think you're going to have to pass that unfortunately, but can I start with one question that, um, so one of the stories that one hears about working with faith-based leaders on gender-based violence is, oh, a lot of the leaders will have as their ultimate goal to keep families together. So if you come to someone and have a, a story of domestic violence, the, the goal is to keep the woman, or the man, if it's a domestic violence partner, with the man, in the, in the family, in the household. Do you come upon that, and does the tool ever, any of the tools that you use ever deal with that issue? I think it comes up <coughs> quite often. And I think, so when we do the trainings, most of my, our workshop starts with storytelling, uh, whether it's faith leaders, uh, you know, gender champions. So we do a storytelling and we do a story mapping. So each of them are asked to think about a story that they heard recently from their communities, and they go into groups, discuss each story, choose a story, and do the mapping. And most often, you know, those stories you know, range from rape to domestic violence, et cetera. 
So we use this story, same stories, to you know kind of unpack the emotions around this, and you know how what they makes them feel, and lead to scriptures that talk about you, your responsibility as a Christian or a Muslim. Is a Muslim. But also we use these stories as an example as we go through the gender norms, we talk about power dynamics, we talk about inequality, etc. So we use these stories to address how it becomes a harmful space like for women if they stay. So we challenge that. I also talk about my mother, my life, my you know mother who was a victim of domestic abuse for 30 years of her life. I talk about, you know, people say praise the Lord, clap the hands and say, hey, it's great. she has five great children. I'm like, what about her? So I think offering personal reflections to keep people saying if, you know, Bible says in John 10, 10, you know, you know, thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come to give life and life in abundance. Who is this life of abundance for? Is this for this women? So we challenge that now. Uh, you know, is it the you know best response for women? Then, if when their home is not safe, they're not, uh, they are at risk of being beaten up, being raped. Is or you know what life of abundance looks like, and we challenge that. So yes, as part of the curriculum, we address this, but also using personal stories because or end the stories, like just in Brazil, in Recife, talking about a pastor who raped, systematically raped his wife every you know, day, and would, it was a ritualistic thing where he would kind of dress up and come to mass after that. And you know, people like that's raped. And the second day of the you know, training, the pastor comes up, you know, one of the guys who subsequent to the devotion, he's like, I can't do devotion, I'm not in a good state of mind. He talks about an affiliate, you know, and he's got a call this morning, apparently one of the pastors who's like very, like a role model to that community, poor community, is having an affair with a 14 year old girl. And people are like, that's rape, you know, and then saying, what about her, his wife? No, what is her response? What about that woman? Do not forget in all of this story that this 14 year old girl thing, and also about that woman, what, what is your response going to be for that? And on that day, we also had the reflection around the story of David, you know, and the rape in his own house, his rape of Bathsheba, you know, use of power, et cetera. So we use, you know, kind of bring all these conversations in, into the space about talking about how do we challenge this? Because I understand most times people like, you know, go back to you. Um, so, yeah, so we say that's another form of active complicity, uh, you know, city in terms of, you know, in terms of that person's, you know, experience of violence, yes. We deal with exactly the same issues. I, I just like to add to it that these dialogues don't have an end. Uh, that the, we as individuals and our faith leaders are individuals, they continue to evolve in their thinking and when new events happen, they can in fact sway them uh, forward and back. So I think that probably the most important thing we're learning is that it's, it is a dialogue. It's one that has to be approached sensitively. It's one that has to be approached repeatedly. And in the context of virtually every political and economic and social change that's happening, it has to be revisited. The security of uh, vulnerable people is not secure just because we finally convinced someone once that they understand that rape is a, actually a bad thing. It's something that, that needs to go on. And so I think being, being uh, understanding the complexity of what doctrine says and then the contradictions to that is important. Uh, the church tell, churches tell us that we're, that we're equal under the sight of God, and then they tell us that men are uh, superior to women. And so how do we deal with those? They're, they're both going on. And, and churches and individuals continue to have to deal with that. And I think it's, it's just important. We're, we're not going to fix this once and walk away. We're going to have to continue to improve the lives of all people. Um, thanks. Uh, kind of touching on what you just mentioned about the idea that we have to talk about this and we have to talk about it repeatedly and issues around making people safe and uh, making sure these things are transparent. And if you're looking at the data, there's nobody anywhere who hasn't been touched directly or indirectly um, by violence. My question is, does anybody know what the curriculum for faith leaders looks like in terms of addressing violence? Does anybody know that? And, and also, um, in terms of trauma for children who are coming through this, um, so what, what about the kids directly and, and how are faith leaders being supported and instructed in how to deal with trauma for the children who are also living through this and then who become the next generation? Well, uh, certainly I don't think there is a single curriculum uh, in existence. Uh, I think that they're still being developed. Uh, we certainly have made tailored tools for the settings we work in, but I think it's, a, it's an open 
it's an open opportunity. There's an awful lot of work that needs to be done in this area, and I, and I would imagine that different faith leaders need different kinds of tools as well. So I, I don't have an answer for you, but we have some tools. I just want to address the issue of children. That's a big one. ABA and um, War Child actually work on these issues directly, working with faith leaders, working with police, working with everybody to make sure that child children are protected. Um, and then also ABA works with the chiefs and the leaders in the community to try and get them to not adjudicate some of these cases. Um, as I said, quanti qualitatively, they're not completely successful, but I think they're getting there. There were some chiefs who said, no, I would never touch that case. It goes directly to the police. So there is some work that's happening and success. Yeah, I mean, so we've had some interesting conversation with uh, you know, faith institutions in the country about seminaries. Uh, in integrating these modules into seminary. So the partner in uh, DRC that we are implementing passages through uh, is a network umbrella Protestant organization which has 25 million members, 320,000 parishes, uh, and thousands of pastors. So our kind of idea of scaling up is also looking at can we include some of these reflections from our toolkit which talks about into the seminaries, into the training processes. We've had conversations with Archbishop of Burundi around this. It's just the logistics of getting there that you know we get ch challenged around like. So, but we are looking at how can some of these reflections be part of the uh, modules that they are, you know, they go through becoming a part of the process of that. So, I think there are conversations around around that. In terms of children, one of the areas that we acknowledge it's not our expertise, uh, and we do want, you know, encourage uh, faith communities to work with those who are working existing services provision organizations like Poor Child, who are doing this work. Because I think it's also important that we tell them there are boundaries in the work that we can do and those services that we can offer. Uh, because there are ethical considerations, et cetera. So kind of where appropriate, we refer them to existing services. An exciting kind of um, thing, a part of intervention, a part of the What Works Consulting is they have these community action groups, which where the health service provider, the legal services, faith leaders of different faith, they meet every month, and they bring in cases of, in different cases of SGBV and GBV, uh, and discuss, you know, what you know, so as a result of that, we've you know sent rape kids to you know there's like okay health services they don't have we've sourced from another donor who's able to send this things like that where they can assist the survivors, so which also then increases you know survivors reporting and you know uh, so bringing together faith leaders into forums in settings. One of the things to acknowledge is that they are not just people who are you know having churches on Sundays. They are also people who are running schools, hospitals. In, in most of the contexts that we work in, the primary service health service provision is by the church or the you know like Islamic institutions. So I think it's important to understand they're not just a monolithic you know kind of um, um, entity, but they have multiple roles in the community uh, and can be influenced to you know provide services that are out of the kind of standard uh, kind of stereotypical roles that we think faith leaders are capable of doing. Just to add very briefly, it's a, a two good questions there. Um, to uh, to reinforce the idea that that uh, it isn't a matter of curriculum, but rather curricula, and by definition, curricula uh, need to be context, faith, uh, and even culturally specific. And so, in fact, there are many uh, versions um, of curricula emerging. And in addition to the ones that have been tagged here, I would draw your attention to the Channels of Hope work, um, which is, uh, has now reached, uh, I believe, over a half a million religious leaders, uh, Christian and Muslim primarily, um, in different cultural and um, uh, 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 contexts um, with supporting tools. But I would reinforce what Prabhu was saying, that we shouldn't think just in terms of curriculum, but rather systems of intervention, systems of support um, for sustainable leadership uh, by faith communities on, on this area. So I would encourage us all to broaden our inquiry to the other kinds of tools and supports that, that can exist to network religious leaders with each other and with agencies of community. In terms of the, um, uh, the, the question related to children, um, and I would point to Stacy here, who, who is a great expert in, in resources um, of, in relation to religion and prevention of violence uh, against children. The Joint Learning Initiative has just started a new learning hub um, on religion and faith and the prevention of violence against children. And it's co-chaired by Aragatu International and uh, World Vision and Karela Eber, who's a great expert in uh, religion and child protection um, at Queen Margaret University in Scotland. Um, and just to to uh, to 
direct you to encourage you to really dig uh, because of the depth of resources that are now gathering around this enormous problem. The statistics that you presented uh, in terms of the impact on children are shocking and so often ignored in, in these debates uh, on gender-based violence. And, uh, I think of the global network on prevention of violence against children and the resources that already got to international. Uh, UNICEF has taken a, a strong lead and is taking um, the power and influence of religious communities very seriously and have tools also uh, available. And again, I've directed to Stacey Nam, uh, who is um, uh, certainly my source of expertise on the prevention of violence against children issue. I just want to add. Let me just also add for children in particular, if you remember the slide that said that 84% of people are religious, there's still that excess, right? So there's the 20, you know, percent about that are not. And in, in DRC and many of the other contexts that I work, some of the worst um, norms that you see are among that population of animists or those who have their local tribal beliefs. And so there's not a lot that addresses that. I mean, you'd have to create a, a, a curriculum for witchcraft um, in many of these places. And some of the worst uh, harmful traditions that I've seen are in that realm. And it's not a small percent when you're looking at it. Um, hi, uh, my name is Megar Abai. I'm with the Baha'i community in the United States. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It's really thought provoking. Um, I think probably when Jean started addressing this question I have, which is that often sort of the initial narrative of our presentation um, addresses sort of say leaders at an individual level um, and then gender champions. And so you have these ideas, sort of these individuals that have begin, begun to reflect and have become transformative actors in a certain way. And I'm wondering about. Um, Capacity, institutional capacity building at the local level within faith communities, and whether there's any experience emerging about, I don't know, committees, working groups, collaborative efforts within the faith community that support this to be an ongoing dialogue or to even keep track of learning and if there's advancement or just like something beyond the individual that sustain this work at the, at the local level, and whether there's any community thought or. How do you know I wanted to make that one? <laughs> well, I was reflecting on these uh, absolutely fantastic presentations um, and uh, thinking about them, so fitting it into the broader context of what I know of religion, faith, uh, and opportunity. And I was thinking also about the leadership. And so here are uh, mediated interventions. Um, so the, the, the groups uh, who have presented today uh, are providing incredible expertise and support, technical support, financial support and so forth to local faith actors, be they leaders, volunteers, uh, members, members of the community. Um, what we're not talking about so much is the, is the, is the direct leadership and the sustaining uh, of that capacity, as, as you very uh, insightfully mentioned. And uh, I think in, in the end, um, the, you know, the project comes and goes, uh, with faith leaders are there. And so the question about the, the, the building of capacity and the partnership, and indeed, uh, the, you know, profoundly the asset-based approach uh, to community development, uh, I think is, is really critical. Um, as so, we're we're hard at work on a, on a, a conference in, in Sri Lanka, uh, which probably is very involved in as well. And some of your organisations are um, on looking at the localising of humanitarian response, and in particular the role of religious and faith-based actors um, in humanitarian response. And coming into this assembly from around the world will be local faith actors themselves uh, who have had direct experience one way or another in aspects of humanitarian response, be it prevention of uh, uh, violence against children, be it um, um, uh, peace and conflict work, uh, humanitarian disaster situations, and so on. And I mean, I think that in in the context of the World Humanitarian Summit last year and the follow-on grand bargain um, agreements that have been made, um, the huge challenge for donors um, and for government bodies, and indeed very large um, uh, developments in humanitarian partners, is this question of how to engage local faith actors in a way that is sustainable and meaningful um, 
and uh, appropriate and, and acceptable, frankly, uh, to the local faith actors themselves. It's something that we're, we're beginning to learn about. Um, on the policy side, one tends to hear, uh, well, yes, I guess we do have to move more towards local partnership. But we also, also tend to hear a huge um, uh, question mark and concern about how to engage with local faith actors. How do I choose a partner? How do, I, how, how, do we, how do we deal with the issue of fragmentation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think as I was listening to these presentations, I also am growing in my understanding of the incredibly important power uh, of the intermediary organization and of the coordinating mechanisms. And I am aware of the evolution um, of the, the technical capacities, such as those very sophisticated ones that are represented here, um, and how they in turn are transforming and must transform uh, to be fully in service of uh, diverse local faith actors. And it's, it's a fascinating area and one I think that is very exciting and very encouraging and very challenging. I think we all have a, have a great deal to learn about that. So my sense is it's very much moving in that direction and uh, you know, it's encouraging to see USA move more towards sustainable relationships with local partners. Uh, I staffed the uh, a national um, coordinating mechanism among faith leaders in Mozambique that was established in 2007 uh, and funded by USAID and for many, many years was funded through intermediary organizations, through ADRA and uh, other organizations. Um, and then just in the last two years, after an enormously complex process, the, the local faith-led interreligious coordinating mechanism has, has now been directly funded by USAID. The eye of the needle that they had to pass through was so excruciating that uh, it, it nearly never happened. So, anyway, I'm rambling on. Just, okay. yeah, just to say, as part of passage, is one of the things we're looking at scaling up. And as I mentioned, we are scaling up horizontally uh, organization wide. So, 17 co congregations out of 320,000. One of the things that we're looking at then, in terms of our scale up strategy, that what we're working on right now, uh, while the intervention is going in, is, is the organizational uh, user capacity. You know what our capacity needs of the organization themselves to sustain this if it's got to be scaled up out, you know outside the intervention after the intervention so we've identified uh, staffing needs you know uh, capacity development in terms of program technical quality in terms of coordination mechanisms of the organization the user itself so i think one of the conversations that we're having with our partners about you know planning for scale up but as part of looking at what's their capacity we built into the project design capacity development activities that do not focus on, you know, intervention, but focuses on the organizational capacity needs in terms of project coordination, monitoring, evaluation, that kind of thing. And I think Passage is a great consortium where there's so many different learning opportunities for partners, they're virtually and, you know, in, in, in meetings like this, where we are talking about communication, we're talking about m and &E, et cetera, with partners, and they are invited to participate. So it's intentional a part of our project, which is because it's a scale up project on social normative intervention. So I think it's, uh, we are looking at you know, building the capacity of the organization. One such thing is from our work in Burundi, because uh, again, the Anglican community and they have the literacy groups that you know, has thousands and thousands of members. So one of the ways is that we built, you know, working with them in terms of building the capacity, how do we integrate that into an existing structure, which they have the capacity to run. So I think it's you know, looking at either what are the gaps uh, in terms of what capacities that, that is required for intervention, but also looking at what existing structures and mechanisms they are, there are and have capacities to do, and how do you bridge that? How do you integrate some of this? So that because they have been running it outside of project intervention. Because the idea for me of you know looking at a faith-based approach is the fact that it can outlast the project timeline. Uh, these conversations are informal, you know, and we do, like I said, we do not get involved in organizing and logistics, etc. Most times. They meet at six o'clock in the morning. Sometimes if it's a village setting, sometimes after church on Sundays, it's up to them. They decide when they're going to meet, etc. So it's organically organized, and the, you know, and the church takes the leadership on that. We don't provide any incentives in terms of for the participants who come, etc. So it's again causes challenges, but also like we working with those challenges to look at what better way do we reinforce, reinfuse life into that so that it can become part of the church or the mosque, the community. I would just I'll give it to you in a second. I would just like to completely agree. It is something that needs to be integrated into the structures, into the organization, into the daily dialogue. But you're going to need these leaders who continue to profile the need to speak out, the need to uh, protect women and children and or vulnerable people. Uh, it is not something which you can simply 
make integrated and then it will go away. It is something that needs to continually be uh, kept an eye on. I, I sort of took your question differently. I took it as you can build capacity, but then how do you sustain it? And one of the issues in Ushindi was that if the funding ended for Ushindi, what would the NOYO do? And we addressed this, actually OSC addressed this through the Integrated Health Project. When we set up the champion communities to do MNCH, gender-based violence, uh, family planning, SBCC, we made them into NGOs. So that, and we train them to, to write proposals, to present, to be able to manage their money so that if the funding ended, there were other funding places that they could go. They didn't have to rely on the project for funding. And this is one of the things that I think the NOYO need to move towards. It also gives cross-training so that, for instance, the, the uh, champion communities through IHP were getting gender-based, had a curriculum for dealing with gender-based violence and intimate partner violence in the communities they were working in. When Ushindi then came in, Ushindi then contracted them through a separate grant to do even more specific for some of them to become NOYO. I will say that we, in the champion communities that we require, the faith-based um, leaders in the community to be part of the community um, because we think it's very important. I will also tell you that one of the champion communities that ultimately failed was one where they made the faith leader the president. He then said, ah, well, this is a way for me to get money for my church. And so he used some money for his church. So you have to make sure that, you're, that whatever your guidelines are, that they're clear, that it's for the community, it's for this, it's not for whatever your idea of what you need it for is. Um, Jeff Jordan, PRB. One, the first announcement for everyone in the room, there was a cell phone left at the front desk, so if you find that you don't have your cell phone, please check on your way out. Um, thank you to the whole panel. And listening to this reminds me of some earlier efforts in terms of linking faith communities into other work in global health, and I wonder if we've captured the lessons learned or if we are integrating those. So pre-PEPFAR, uh, in the early, late 90s, um, AID funded some work on looking at faith-based communities in HIV. This was pre-being able to do really anything about treatment. It was all about prevention. It was about stigma and other kinds of things and trying to enlist the faith community. Um, part of that effort was faith leaders um, and particularly finding champions, particularly men, pastors who were HIV positive um, as part of understanding stigma, getting them to speak out on it, but it also had to deal with kind of a self-transformation. What was their role? Because most likely any of them who were HIV positive meant that they were acting in ways that weren't necessarily um, faithful to their sets of values and mission and everything else. Um, so having to admit to um, affairs outside of marriage or other kinds of things, because more often than not, they were the ones who brought HIV AIDS into their own families. Um, and so what did that mean for how did they come to terms with that and then how did they work on stigma and discrimination and other kinds of things within it. I don't remember at the time that we ever moved it into a gender context, into a gender equity or other kind of context. I just remember it as an initiative that really was looking at trying to get people to speak so that issues of discrimination and being able to bring the dialogue into the church or into faith communities to make it, to destigmatize it was there. But we didn't kind of, I don't remember it making that next shift. It would be interesting to know whether or not those champions from that time, because this would have been, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, are people who should also be champions here in thinking about transformation and thinking about what that means. Or were there other lessons from that within, you know, I think about it for JLI and others. Are there other lessons that we learn from other types of initiatives that actually either reinforce or open up gaps that we didn't realize or create new opportunities? And again, that's why I love the fact that there are kind of, because of the representation of the panel, that we pulled multiple communities together into this dialogue today across the IGWG and JLI communities and the Faith and Global Health and others that you know, gives us some power of sharing both information and recognizing where that's going. So I'm not quite sure what the question in that was, but just kind of an acknowledgement that I think that there are more things out there that we may not be uh, building upon. I'll maybe 
take a, an initial crack at that. Um, yes, I think that uh, religion and sexual gender-based violence is, is one of the more challenging areas of application um, and intervention um, because of uh, the complicated attitudes, uh, faith-based attitudes uh, towards women, towards sex, towards reproduction, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is, this is one of the areas, I would say, just from our overview, that is least developed when it comes to faith-based uh, intervention and the, um, the support and uh, leadership of a religious and faith-based organization. I think there are lots and lots of lessons to be learned. Um, going back to my little presentation, one of the areas I wanted to emphasize was the uh, holistic focus of faith leaders. And, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're just simply not interested in the one dimension du jour that you know we want to bring uh, to them profoundly. And so the opportunity is to work more holistically with their own power, their own influence, their the possibility of um, their uh, impacting um, the common good for their members and for their communities as a whole. And we see time and again that that is very persuasive and, and enormously of interest. Um, so. I think that, uh, again, uh, if you would like to just take a look at the Joint Learning Initiative website, you'll see um, that, that it is a source of, of a whole range of um, focal points uh, when it comes to religion, faith, and, and uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. I'm really interested in the sort of what I see as a movement um, towards the uh, mobilization um, and support and accompaniment um, of local faith communities. Um, that is taking place on a very, very large scale. Um, we have a learning hub on mobilization of local faith communities that your friend is, is an active uh, member of, and IMA as well. But it includes folks like Salvation Army and Samaritan's Purse and Planet Relief and an extraordinary number of people, number of organizations who have at the heart of their mission the accompaniment of the local faith community. So, for example, Tier Fund itself has a, a strategic goal of mobilizing and accompanying 500,000 congregations throughout the world. You think about the scale of that, just within that organization alone. And then you put that together with other organizations who are working in the same jurisdictions and maybe with other, other faiths. Um, it, it is uh, the, the multiplier effect of the congregation, in a sense, as a unit of change, with all the complexity and all the challenges that we've unpacked here and are particularly visible uh, in areas of, of profound disagreements and uh, 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 different different perspectives when it comes to sexual gender violence, uh, I, I think that the possibility of uh, this, in some ways, new uh, area in public health, a new area in global health, um, is, is really huge and very exciting. I think we're going to take a few of questions and then we'll go to the ones online. Thank you. Um, Akif Abdurrahman, I'm a gender advisor at USAID in the Office of Population and Reproductive Health. Sorry, I'm Sam. Um, so I have two questions, and they're not very, they're, they're brief. Um, the first question is, you know, we talk, we talk about behavior change and how faith leaders, um, they can change their behavior. We talked about that earlier. But I was, and, and we scratched the surface at, at what I'm about to, to ask. Um, I wanted to talk about faith leaders and the fact that in some contexts, they often do engage in these spaces because they know that they'll be able to learn certain skills, certain advocacy skills that they can then use to then work against the development objectives that you're sort of coming to. So for example, I work in family planning, working for them with the family planning objectives. So if you could talk about your experiences with that and been able to, in, to address the, this type of um, uh, issue or, or situation. And then the second question was, um, I think you mentioned um, seeing faith leaders not as something that you can use as a tool, but as partners. And I was hoping you could unpack that because I think a lot of programs, when, you, when they think about designing traditional leaders or religious leaders into their um, their program, the idea is that, oh, we can use them as a communication channel to, to move our messages and to reach people, but, and failing to notice that in and of themselves, they are or should be part and parcel of the program. So I was hoping if you could unpack some lessons learned or some sort of tips that people can, can use when they're working to design their programs 
um, with traditional and religious leaders. Two, uh, two tricky questions. Um, well, on, the, on the family planning, uh, uh, Melinda Gates' interest in this area is very, is very interesting and very powerful. Um, and as you may know, uh, the Gates Foundation has, has poured a lot of money uh, into uh, the whole question of influencing and changing uh, faith attitudes and behaviors towards family planning. One of the key learnings, I think, from the, uh, the investments and the projects there, both in the U.S. and uh, overseas, is that it's important uh, to meet faith leaders uh, where they are. Um, and so the healthy timing and spacing, for example, um, uh, as, a, as an approach, um, has now received you know, considerable uh, investment and, and there has been considerable progress. There's also been considerable progress made on educating faith leaders about family planning where there aren't necessarily doctrinal uh, issues. Um, but I would say that, uh, again, in my experience, the, the question is to, to approach the faith leader and the faith community, or indeed the religious body as a whole, take the Catholics, for example, uh, in, in terms of a respectful dialogue and un understanding that the power uh, is, is to influence the whole person and, and, uh, and, and to be strategic about the question about where can we go. This is not necessarily going to be the solution to the whole family planning question, uh, uh, indeed. But are there possibilities for progress? Some of you will remember um, years ago when I was at the National Cathedral, um, a whole group of organizations uh, got together to launch something called the Women's Faith and Development Alliance. And uh, we, those of us who started the dialogue, um, were very aware of the complete breakdown uh, in conversation between faith based organizations, the women's movement, and uh, international development uh, bodies. And uh, we sought over differences in, on reproductive rights, um, and we sought to discover what it was that we could do together. Now, we didn't arrive at a doing together uh, around family planning, but we sure arrived at a lot of doing together in other areas. And I think that the friendship and the mutual understanding and the, and the, re, the rebooting of conversation uh, was very critical to other things that have gone on. We focused in that case on uh, resources, funding resources for women and girls, and we were persuasive in getting a huge network of governments and NGOs and corporate and so on to raise $1.4 billion in new resources for women and girls. So the power of the conversation and the power of the coming together rather than allowing ourselves actually to be divided by this profound and important area, but still the thing that divides us is something I would really like to flag. For us, uh, we've not had any experience in terms of like faith leaders coming into programs and then using it as counter tech towards us. The conversation on family planning is quite new to the intervention for us. Uh, so we've used IPV like uh, or GVV as the entry point, and I think that's uh, been a great entry point to talk about. Then bringing into conversations about planning. Um, like I said again at the beginning of the intervention, we are not experts. Like we do not expect <coughs> or the genetic champions from the church to talk about modern you know methods of family planning. That's not. You know, but what we do is that we found out is that those two weeks of reflections create the space for people from ASF and PSI clinics to come and do the health talk in the church. Um, so, you know, I think that creating a space and entry point is important, like, you know, finding ways to have meaningful conversations, like I said, the conversation has progressed over, over the years, uh, and in, in and context specific as well. Like, you know, the one in the Zipi, we talked about homophobic violence, you know, uh, and in South Africa, we talked about, you know, facilitated the conversation with sex workers and church leaders. But in places like Rwanda and Burundi, you know, we are still in conversation about GVV, et cetera, because again, that's where they are at in terms of the conversation. Um, so I think it's again saying where it works and most appropriate and, and looking for entry points in the conversations. And, and we feel like sexual use in the voices of survivors is a powerful entry point because they feel the church feels it's a mandate to elevate suffering of people and all people, and then using that as the entry point to talk about more kind of deep rooted systematic issues like gender inequality in the church. And we've come a long way in that sense. But I've not had experience where they, we've had uh, pastors or leaders of the congregations who participate in the process using and then use the, the methods that we've used as uh, kind of points against us. We've not had experience. But we've had challenges in the Passages Project where 
uh, you know, the leadership of ECC, you know, who have misconception around family planning and say, hey, this, but that has always been a great opportunity for us to engage with them and say, hey, this is what we're talking about. Family planning is not about whether you have two children or five children or 10 children or, you know, whatever. It's about planning, it's about resources, it's about having choice, it's about uh, men, men and women having conversations about what, you know, suits their lifestyles and then accessing services. And then most of them have said, we don't, we don't have a problem on the decisions that made in that intimate unit. You know, so again, so we have a mix of mixed bag of people who are, you know, so, but also addressing some of the misconceptions as well. And again, creating these are choices that these women and men make. And how do you create spaces for those choices to happen in safe space where they don't face sanctions from the community they're part of and feel important, you know, about the faith. So they feel like this is not against their values and principles. Yeah, we also haven't had any experience with faith-based community or community members coming in to sort of sabotage our work. I, I think that our experience is, though, that there is an awful lot of room among faith communities to uh, to agree that people need access to safe and available health care, and that if you can frame it in the context of choice and availability, it uh, gives you an awful lot of flexibility for <coughs> making a range of services available. We have an online question from Rose Wilcher of SHI 360. Rose, go ahead. Are you there? You can't hear me? Oh, now we're oh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, I don't know what happened there. Hi, everyone. This is Rose Wilcher from FHI 360. Um, I co-chair this GBV task force with Charlotte. Uh, and I just want to thank all the panelists today. This has been a really interesting session. Um, I have two questions. So, and the first we've touched on a bit, but, you know, I was really struck during Jean's um, opening remarks, which were very effective um, in setting the stage for me. I, I was just really struck with, at the potential that exists for effective public health programming when we partner with faith communities. It seems that so many of the necessary ingredients for effective public health programming are, are sort of already in place in terms of being able to, to work at scale and in terms of having access to these very influential but trusted leaders in the communities, in terms of being able to ensure our programming is locally responsive and holistic and inclusive. Those are all such important <laughs> aspects of, of public health programming. And at the same time, Jean also mentioned, you know, that working with faith communities, you also have, you know, there's there are these potential harmful norms at play, right? These patriarchal cultures that reinforce gender inequality. And I, I mean, specifically when we're talking about partnering with faith communities to address gender-based violence, I guess my question is, you know, how do we ensure that, that faith-led efforts in this realm, in fact, do no harm? And we know that, you know, in, in GBV programming, doing no harm is one of the most fundamental principles of that work. And so how do we ensure that this, this work does effectively challenge the harmful gender norms that give rise to violence in the first place? And I mean, I guess that's both a theoretical question, but also more practically in terms of program monitoring. Are there things that we can do as we're implementing that are really keeping an eye on that and ensuring that, you know, that, that we're, we are in fact doing no harm? Um, my, my other question I th is also a bit more practical, but um, I, I'm hearing the discussion around, you know, sustainability and the importance of these dialogues to become really embedded in the life of, of the faith communities. But I'm also think, you know, in terms of um, thinking about packaging and replicating and scaling up uh, the, the, these approaches in other places, do we know anything from, from evaluations that have been done about what we need for an effective dose response, for example? You know, Prabhu talked about these, these you know, 
these community dialogues, these workshops that happen, but you know, how many do we need to do or how long does that effort need to be sustained in order for there to really be some transformation? Thank you. <laughs> Those are really good, tough questions. I was uh, looking over to Lynn uh, as the methodologist to know how we might track um, uh, harmful norms and uh, how, to, how to ensure that, uh, that, that on an ongoing basis that we weren't doing more harm than good. Um, I guess as I listen to the question, um, I, the pragmatist uh, in me says um, that uh, you know, we, we don't control the whole situation here. <laughs> um, faith communities um, uh, are so diverse and so um, pluralistic, and uh, you know have, have so much of a share. When from the health point of view, so much of, of a range of things that are good and are not good. Um, that uh, uh, I, I think that the the um, the, the, the sort of the underlying assumption of the question um, is perhaps the, the wrong place to start uh, when when it comes to public health intervention because we, I, I mean there's just there's absolutely no way um, that, uh, that that we're in charge in a sense once once you engage with the faith community um, they're not public health uh, professionals they're not development actors they're faith leaders and so uh, I mean. I suppose it's a binary choice to engage or not to engage, but once you're engaged, um, you're in. And then the question is indeed perhaps tracking and really, really paying attention. Um, I think uh, in terms of, I, I love the, the dose response question. I mean, I think that that's definitely a, a fascinating area because certainly in, in our work with malaria, for example, um, uh, it, there is longitudinal. Uh, Study that, that shows that a trained faith leader um, is going to continue to deliver um, malaria prevention, malaria treatment messages on, uh, on an ongoing sustained basis uh, after a fairly limited uh, training. Uh, so that, that's, that, that is one area, but I think that's, that's a really, I mean, as we come to understand more about how to equip faith leaders um, with meaningful attitude and behavior change uh, uh, information, the dose response question will certainly be very key. Just in terms of <clears throat> how we, I mean, in terms of do no harm and how do we monitor some of the things. I think um, for us, one of the things I found exciting was the panel visits that we built into the project uh, what books. I know it's like three years, but from the inception of the project, uh, you know, every quarterly, you know, we have uh, interviews with the faith leaders and their spouses, generally champions and their spouses, as a way of tracking the trajectory of their thinking around, you know, sexual and gender-based violence and the norms associated with that. Um, and, I mean, in these panels, we, sit, we can see clear patterns of, you know, shifting, uh, you know, and some of the underlying thinking around um, their ideologies in terms of, you know, gender GBV. So, I think, I mean, so yeah, so for us, we are, for us to monitor, you know, what are some of the things they're saying, and how can it be, you know, how do we monitor, you know, uh, some of the harmful things that could come go out? Like like I said, they agree. We talk about ten things, they agree with two things, and sometimes they interpret the two things in a way to justify the other eight things. You know, so I think how do we really engage with that? So we've used these panel visits, which ongoing basis of the WhatWorks project, but to kind of continually monitor and re-engage the faith leaders. So what we do is we review the panel visits every, you know, six months. And then we re-engage the faith leaders into their, you know, the visits when we have the Hilo Africa staff who's partner implementing it, going back into having these conversations again with the faith leaders themselves, reinforcing, re you know, these conversations that we want, challenge some of the things that they've said in their in their panel visits. So I think that's the one way. And the other thing is around passages, we have these ethnography, you know, ethnographers who go into the congregations, listen to the sermon, they're re taking, you know, kind of notes of the sermon that's been preached. Uh, so that we can actually analyze some of the things that we can really look at what's being said. And we are in the first uh, primary analysis at the moment and the content of the sermons uh, for us to see what's being said, because like I said, it can go south really quickly, you know. So, um, it's, yeah, so just looking at that data as well, because I think it's important to not make an assumption that, you know, somebody's saying positively, pushing positivism equates, you know, and it's again a journey, and I think it's about how do you re-engage, how do you build these conversations into back into reinforcing some of these things as well. So I think we are committed to the idea of not doing harm. The same with the whole thing around working with men and boys as well, right? Like, I mean, 
how do we engage men and boys in a way that it's you know safe and accountable and not you know so i think it's one of those conversations that we want to better implement i think the challenge is also that then because we work in rural areas accessibility is difficult you know it's very difficult to get you know project officers and staff going into these places or researchers who cannot access these areas so like we are trying to find better ways we are trying to equip so one of the things like uh, train the gender champions to collect this money from data as well so that we don't have to rely on you know somebody else coming from outside to go into that um in terms of how many gender champions uh, how many com community dialogues does it take i hope we'll find out at the end of the passages project in 2019 when we finish in line um, and also the work works in line is about to start we are at the end of the project so i think hopefully We've had re, uh, you know, because we ran out of number of people to go into the community dialogues because it's like 25 villages. We have people going back into the community dialogues, like so because there are about 4,000 people who have gone through the community dialogues in what works. Uh, so we will find out. I think it's again like how long. I'm a man. I've been a man for the last 35 years. How long does it is it going to take for me to un unpack my uh, pri male privilege and power and patriarchy and? Uh, so hopefully it'll be on my encryption of my tombstone. <laughs> Back. <laughs> yeah, hopefully by that time at least, right? <laughs> hey Rose, thanks for those questions. On um, uh, do no harm, I think we know based on data that mental health symptoms are associated and those are some of the most frightening given the suicidal ideation and suicide attempt rates. I think following mental health screening tools periodically I think is important. Um, but again, gender-based violence you know, the socioeconomic, um, political, I mean, everything influences it, so you have no idea. I mean, you can also look at, you know, how things change in DRC. One day you have conflict, the next day you don't. And so doing no harm, you know, means that you need to now change because it wasn't, it's no longer household violence, it's now conflict-related violence. <laughs> so that makes it harder. I'm not saying you can't monitor it, I'm saying you just have to be agile. As far as dose response, I don't think there are any studies. I think that what works will work. I mean, let me give you an example. I thought anti-Semitism and racism in the U.S. was dead. Um, it seems that it's not. So I think fixing it doesn't, or thinking that you fixed mm -hmm. it, doesn't doesn't mean that that's the case. And I think that's the most frightening part of it all. I would like to just say one more thing to Rose's uh, good question. Um, there have been mentions um, uh, throughout the, the panel um, to interventions that, that actually meet um, uh, communities of faith and, and members of communities who are not religious leaders themselves to raising awareness uh, within faith-based communities and within communities as a whole. And I think that's a very important strategy and that we have to have confidence in that as also a way of countering um, uh, negative and inappropriate and harmful uh, leadership by faith leaders. I think about my own country, Ireland, um, in the last census, 85% uh, of Irish people identify themselves as Catholic. 14% of Catholics go to Mass in Ireland now. Why is that? Because people walked and the church disgraced itself uh, in relation to its own, the harmful practices by some of its faith leaders. And more importantly, the institution of the church was disgraced uh, by its failure to deal with those individuals. And, uh, you know, you have to have terrific confidence in a way in, uh, in, in, the, in the sensible, self-protective decisions of people. It doesn't mean that, you know, religion is dead, but, um, you know, it, it was just, so I think that this is, it's, it's a multi-pronged intervention. Um, and uh, I think that part of the intervention is working also with communities of faith themselves uh, to, as checks and balances for the potential harmful practices of leaders. One last question, I think we'll sneak in. The last question is from Gloria at World Vision. She says, thank you to all the presenters for sharing their excellent work engaging FBOs on GCC. Youth groups play very active roles in church leadership and mobilization. How much have we engaged the young people in the FBO network to address GBC, uh, GBV? Thank you, Gloria. So uh, again, you know, I do passages I don't want to sound like a broken record. So intentionally, you know, uh, idea is about you know, young adolescents, like 18 to 24. So we're working with them, but we found challenging because it's also there's limited exclusive criteria. That's newly married parents and first time uh, first time parents and newly met, married couples. What we are seeing in DRC, especially in Kinshasa, very urban setting, is that it's very difficult to find young newly married couples within the age of 18 to 24. 
because they are cohabiting, but they're not married. As, uh, so we've extended kind of the, expanded the age bracket to 30 at the moment. But we are working with you know young people. I mean, the gen most of the gender champions are young people who are actively involved in this. And I think within the Passages Consortium, there's a strong uh, commitment to actively engaging young people at governance levels in in the in our communities of practices. In our in our uh, when we you know even in the Passages project in ERC. So I think there is. Um, again, in just coming out of Dahuk in uh, Kurdish region, I'm, I'm not supposed to say Kurdistan. Um, you know, again, working with young people, we're actually looking at an exciting project, looking at uh, young people from the Yazidi communities, young people in one of the two universities, Dako and uh, Dahuk universities, you know, looking at, again, GBV prevention, using the transfer masculinity model, but um, but also looking at social cohesion, et cetera. How do you bridge those gaps? Not just having these young people go into the camps, but also have young people coming into the universities as well. So that's way of breaking stereotypes, the power dynamics between the communities. <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. That's like <laughs> first <story. laughs> So yeah, so I think it's exciting and it's new for us. Uh, we're excited about that. But I, again, I think there is an engagement um, to work with young people. Again, like I said, we are looking at structures within the church. One of the structures is the youth groups and the youth, you know. So we want to engage with young people. We don't explicitly engage them as young people per se, but they bring are brought into the conversation because of other categories. So the Ashindi project also used with used youth groups. I, you know, our project is starting to end. So I, I have to say that the future opportunities seem even more urgent, especially with the opportunities with social media and maybe cross border, even cross space opportunities for dialogue. I think it's it's uh, yet to be fully exploited. They were extremely popular. I, I think that there's an increasing knowledge in all of public health that we've not we've given adolescents short shrift, uh, and so as part of that shift. Uh, certainly, GBV is one of the areas that we need to engage youth more. Thank you so much to all of you. This was amazing. And again, we've gone over 11.30, but it was well worth it. I think we could go on and on. And um, if everyone agrees, I'll ask you each individually, but I will post all your presentations. And thank you very much to all of you. Thank 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 you.